<gasps> Adam Curry, John C. Devore. It's Thursday, June 27th, 2019. This is your award winning Gimbo Nation Media Assassination, episode 1150. This is No Agenda. Enjoying all the bugs on offer in my city and broadcasting live from the frontier of Austin, Texas, capital of the Drone Star State. In the morning, everybody, I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley, where the Democrats all say, El podcast no agenda es lo más importante. I'm John C. Boy. It's Craig Vaughn and Buzzkill. In the morning. <laughs> okay, we can all go home. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our show. Ah, very good, very good. <laughs> I uh, I have to admit, I uh, I did double duty, but really chose for a different activity last night. Sex? Oh God, I wish. No, I uh, second best thing. I went out to dinner with the New York former New York banker. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, which you know, it's like really, dude. You know what I do? You're gonna take me out on a Wednesday night? When you know the debates you can go are watch on, the debates at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> I bet all the bars had the debates on. No, not where we went. Uh-uh. Well, in L.A. they did. Oh, really? The, you would have actually it would have been a very Austin thing, but he took me to a brand new restaurant. Um, okay. And let me tell you, this is big outside money coming into Austin. Look up Commodore, C O M E D O R, Commodore, in Austin. This is. I don't know how much they paid to 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 build this restaurant. It well, is they, cool. Yeah. Hmm? C O M E D O R? Yeah, Comedor. Austin? Yes. They got some like celebrity guys, I guess, and <clears throat> some kind of well-known chef. It's a Mexican restaurant, but it has a very specific hook besides it being, you know, total kind of a uh, hipster place. Yeah. In architecture, I mean, seriously, the, the way they built this with, you know, cool, you know, they can open up the whole side of the of the restaurant and they've got these, you know, beautiful chains, you know, looks very um, steampunkish. But is this, the big, is this the big brown building or the one next to it? Uh, it's, what color is the building? It's the, it's, well, it's brown. You just see brick in the front. It's, uh, oh, it's yeah. brown. Anyway, it's giant. Their, uh, their hook is they serve bugs. Oh, brother. <laughs> how could how could I pass it up? <laughs> did you have any bugs? Of course I did. I had the ants and the grasshoppers. Oh, God. <laughs> Doomed. <laughs> I, I, honestly, it was disappointing. Because they, they have one... Because, you know, the, the girl comes over and she's like, well, you know, can I help you with anything? So, yeah, what has the grasshoppers... Kind of insult, you know, I've been to Mexico, Mexico City. So I've been all... I don't know that I went to uh, one of the better restaurants in Mexico City and they had bugs on the menu. Well, it was... Here's the disappointment. They weird mold that you get off of corn, but... Yes, they, yeah, they serve that as well. The, the, yeah. It's fungus, I think. Well, whatever it is. Yeah. It's really tasty. <laughs> it's very tasty. <laughs> Um, I was disappointed. I'm thinking I'm gonna have gra- you know, I'm gonna see a grasshopper. I'm gonna have to crunch this thing in my teeth. These were little baby grasshoppers, like they just came out of an incubator. Little preemies. Oh, yeah. It was just a sprinkling on top. You now you can't. You couldn't really. T- I tried to take a picture. You can't really tell if it's great. You know, maybe maybe it was just you could see an odd leg or two. Um. But it was, uh, well, it, it, you know, a place like this is that it's a good cover for when it gets infested by cockroaches. <laughs> and then the ants were on the dessert, on the ice cream. So they, oh, they charming sprinkle a little dab. Which interestingly, the New York banker turned his nose up at that. He he tried it with, Ugh. whereas I tried him and I thought, hmm, peppery. Yeah, well, they're peppery. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so then you did double duty. So you came back and watched the debates after the fact. No, I, I skimmed through it. Yeah, this it was, I, there was I knew this watch. wasn't going to be much. And you know, and although for me it was kind of interesting to see the uh, the audio, the technical issues they had, I really felt bad. Well, everyone's laughing, and if, you know, <laughs> and of <laughs> course, he's got their hit in her tit in her ringer. Right I now. know it's. I know this feeling. There's a guy, and he's pulling his hair out, and. They can't figure out why the routing from the IFB from the from the 
from the control room is routing through to the floor and probably in everyone else's IFB. Oh, and, and by the way, with these new rigs, I don't even know. I don't, don't know if I could even operate one. They have this networking system. I don't even know. They, there's a name for it. And everybody uses it. Oh, it's the audio networking. Yeah, it all it all runs through. There's no more cables. Cable. No, no <laughs> more cables. Cable. It's, it's, it's Ethernet. You can't go unplug anything. No, it's all Ethernet. So the, the, the routing matrix is completely digitized. And if it gets... I mean, I... This is why I felt bad. I couldn't really sit there with Schadenfreude going, ha, 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 you suck. Uh, even though I understand why people think it's funny. But from a professional standpoint, I feel bad. Some guy, something happened, and I've been there so many times on this very show. So, I, I, you know, I, uh, I did like the memes, though. I did, tr- Trump was tweeting all kinds of funny memes about, and of course, distracting from anything by just you know highlighting the audio glitch um but also but also you know everyone on stage almost everyone on stage they take the, themselves so seriously and and especially MSNBC and Rachel and and Chip Chuck Chad cast they go like, what the debate was we're participating in democracy oh, please you stupid little dog and pony show it's not even a debate. They can have ten people and have a debate. Have you ever yeah. you you were a, a master debater, weren't you in uh, in school? I was always a master debater. <laughs> I, I, I masturbated. Master, okay, here we go. Whoa! <laughs> you can't even keep the joke alive. <laughs> no, I tried. <laughs> Thank, well, thank let's you. Let's start. Let's start with this. You nailed it. You dropped the ball. You unnailed it. And you went off your merry way with <laughs> Stacey Abrams. What? Yes. I remember this. It was about a year or maybe two years ago yeah. when no, you no, called ta- out Are you talking- Castro as the guy, the go-to guy. No. Incorrect. Yes. No. Incorrect. It was Pennebaker, the professor in Austin, when he was accusing me and my then future wife of having white privilege and saying that the Castro brothers were going to be the ones. It wasn't me. It was from an Obot dinner. Well, you brought it up. <laughs> That's different. In and fact, so Castro was the guy who won. You think? To oh, I, I disagree. I disagree. Well, you can disagree all you want, but every if you read anything today, this morning, and if you watch the thing with a Democrat perspective, or you listen to the kids. Now, the, I'm going to play some clips from the teen panel. Can I just say one thing about Castro briefly? Last night, the only thing the banker said, the former banker said about the debates was, well, this should be Castro's last stand. He should be out of there by now. And I have no idea. It came out of the blue. I didn't really ask him about anything. He pinpointed Castro as Castro's got to go. And I'm just taking this in you know, for what it is, elite circles, etc. He's probably anti-bank or something. I mean, Castro's <laughs> not going to get in anyway, but he just, he's not going to go after this performance. He would, Most people saw him as number one. Uh, and for, let's listen with the teens. At now, what what, what is panel. this? Yeah, what is this teens panel? What's going on with this? NBC put together a panel of teens, the millennials, and they're not all teens. I mean, most of them college students, but I'm calling them teens because they sounded like. Um, give you an example of the... Uh, of the teen pan- here's a comment from one of the teen one of the college panelists. This is a guy with a probably an inflamed amygdala, uh, <laughs> Trump hater. I'm guessing, uh, confused in general. And I want you to listen to this guy and tell me what he said after after you play this clip, which is teen panel weird comments that go nowhere. Clip. I'm also very interested in the preventative care model that a lot of uh, the Democratic candidates have seemed to suggest tonight, where we look at the root causes of the issue, whether that is gun control or immigration uh, or health care. And we notice that there's a lack of economic opportunity and there's also um, a lack of care services that are implemented throughout one's lifetime that might result um, in these really terrible social issues. <laughs> What? <laughs> uh, was I supposed to understand that somehow? That was very, very difficult. It was just dropping in memes, and it was like there was nonstop, and he never really concluded anything. It was idiotic. But that, but that was the group. This is a bunch of uh, young college kids, and they, and so here, I got a couple of things here. Here they're talking about uh, the the Spanish that was initiated by Castro. No. Beto? No. 
What are you talking about? It was initiated by the uh, uh, Beto. Yeah, Beto. That's what I said, Beto. In the first, in the first uh, round of questions, which brought, which had me take some notes on it, because there's a couple of things I noticed. One was Amy Klobuchar when they first turned the camera on her, she was, if you had a 4K TV and you could get, it had a good uh, upscaling, she was shaking like a leaf. Well, I thought Booker's face was pretty funny when Beto oh. started doing that. Booker's face was like, oh, and a whoop, what? Well, yeah. Booker's face lit up when, when Beto O'Rourke started speaking Spanish, and so then Booker felt he had to speak some Spanish, and of course, the only guy who could really speak perfect Spanish was uh, Castro. Uh, and then the other one that really I thought was a pure fail was Tulsi. Is She's he- asked a question right off the bat. Her first question was a, was a very specific question. And instead of even coming close to answering it, she goes off on her on her creds on her uh, bio, her her uh, you know her background and how she went to the war a number of times, and, and she's the only anti-war candidate. It had nothing to do with it, so she was out. And then the other thing I noticed, the major thing I noticed, that this again would be a NBC staging. There were nobody was using apple crates, so you 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 saw a a. a a midget, a dwarf, a big, tall dude. I mean, it was horrible looking. It, the- you know, it's interesting you say that. As I looked at the shot, and again, it was I didn't get home until quarter to ten. And as I looked at the shot, I'm like, "What? It sounds wrong with this." And I couldn't quite pinpoint it, but you just you just nailed it. They they didn't e- equalize the candidates. They didn't have to equalize them so they're even. No, but, but a they- little bit. A little something because you got a six nine guy there. You got another tall dude. Uh, Tulsi's pretty big, so she held her own. But you got a, a pretty much a borderline dwarf with Klo- Klobuchar, and then <laughs> Warren is a diminutive. She's a petite woman, and so they needed to put them on a on a full crate at least. By the way, we're talking as television producers here, not as uh, not as hateful people. <laughs> this is how television producers talk. That lady's borderline dwarf. Get her an apple crate. Yeah. By the way, I'm, I, I disagree about Tulsi, but we can get to that later after you're done with well, uh, your Tulsi, team I panel. Was, a, was, the, was one of the losers, but but so let's listen to the kids talking about uh, this about what they thought about them speaking Spanish. What were some eye roll moments? Because I definitely saw some from you guys, <laughs> Ariane. I saw a lot from you when Cory Booker was talking. I saw a, a couple, like, oh God, from you guys. So, w- w- what were some of those things that, that you weren't so thrilled about? Uh, when Beto spoke Spanish, you didn't like. Initially, didn't like I don't it. want to say I didn't like it, but I think it like caught some people off guard, and you could see even some of the other candidates were a little uh, shaken up by that. So I thought that was Booker's expression is, is yeah. trending all over yeah. Twitter. <laughs> I think just as the Spanish speaking went on, I thought that it was great when Beto did it the first time, but then as it continued on with the multiple candidates, I felt like, especially with Booker, it kind of felt like pandering. Um, for some reason, it just didn't feel as genuine coming from him. And I just feel like any moments that didn't feel as genuine coming from the candidates when we talked about, like... Wait a minute, let me ask you a question. Like, is this like a White Valley girl type like girl who has who's talking about pandering like to brown people? Is she even allowed to do that? Doesn't she have white privilege? Like, is that okay? Blah, 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 blah. Then any politics when Booker you kept talking. You need to add the vocal fry to make that work. <laughs> I can't do it. Talking about his neighborhood mm-hmm. repeatedly um, in kind of the same fashion. Um, I uh-huh. felt like that was another role moment mm-hmm. for me. Typical. Typical. I got a lot of feedback from the millennials about this. They thought it was, they didn't like it. Didn't like any of it. And I'm surprised. I'm like, how can you be so racist? Just using their words. <laughs> well, anyway, let's listen to this clip retaining. Uh... I'm sorry. Retain? Debate, de- debate teen Oh, I'm sorry. Retain. Yes, I got it. How we often have to try to balance the two, finding jobs or taking care of the environment and seeing what's going to happen in the future. So Elizabeth kind of talked about um, the Green Deal, Green New Deal, kind of um, helping those who are within these ind- dying industries, um, helping them to retrain into newer industries. Mm-hmm. That way, they're not necessarily losing their jobs. They are simply moving into something else that would be, be able to help not only the economy, but to be able to help the environment. So that's actually a very interesting perspective. So so I want to talk about this. I, I'm sorry I played that clip. I should play it later. I, I, this retraining is was not retaining. All right, here's the final clip from these guys. And this is what they who they think. Well, I know I got two clips from them. Okay, this is the uh, teen panel discussion about the working class. 
Did you get the specifics on the economic issues that we talked about in our uh, before the debate that you were no. hoping for? I mean, Mayor de Blasio specifically kept talking about how he wants to shift the Democratic Party back to being the party of the working class, but never really gave me any you know specific policy solutions for it. And the fact of the matter is, is that blue collar America is happening in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, those key states that the president won in 2016 because this message resonated with those kinds of voters. Blue collar America isn't happening as much in New York City as it is in places like that, in places, you know, like me at home in West Virginia. So I felt like that, you know, a lot of the candidates sort of talked about, you know, Elizabeth Warren talked about the poor people, but I felt like it was more about, you know, helping them as poor people and not getting them back on their feet, finding jobs for them and putting them into careers where they can support their families again. Well, that's not that. I think that's valid. That's a good point. Yeah. I thought it was a very good point. All, the, all I ever hear is, we'll give you money. We'll, give, we'll fix your problems with money. Don't worry about anything systemic. We'll fix it with money. Well, so some of these young Democrats may be thinking otherwise, and I think they're uh, <clears throat> these guys are losing them. That's why they think the Bernie appeals so much. So let's here's their – now, this is the finale clip. This is each one of them saying who they thought won the debate. All right, guys, quick lightning round. Who won tonight in your eyes? We'll start with Valentina and go this way. Um, Julian Castro for actually talking policy. Julian Castro. Castro for the same reasons. Wow. Secretary Castro. Uh, I think Warren actually did a good job, uh, but I do agree. I thought Castro stood out as one of the lesser known candidates. I was actually uh, very surprised by Mayor de Blasio's uh, ideas and yeah. his messaging. Wow, so Castro kind of stole the spotlight and de Blasio came out a little yeah, bit surprisingly. too. Um, awesome. Well, awesome. Thanks, awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming, awesome. everybody. Don't forget, your awesome. to- don't forget your goodie bag, your tote bag, your swag bag on the way out. Awesome, boys and girls. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact that we even have to somehow have to have winners is dumb oh, yeah. it's ludicrous the whole thing is oh, it's ludicrous it's there's no dumb. winner and you put t- it's fun 10 people on a page i want to play tulsi gabbard because this was the i've liked her and this is if there's any democrat i've liked consistently on this show for years it's tulsi gabbard it's, yeah and uh, you can call her a loser she's a loser in this no there's no winners let's <laughs> hold hands tell a secret <laughs> No, I think what she did with uh, the Ryan character, was that Tim Ryan? Ted yeah. Ryan? Or Fred Ryan. Fred know. Ryan. Uh, I, I, th- I think she, uh, she butt slammed him good. I've been in Congress 17 years, and 12 of those years I've sat on the Armed Services Committee, either the Defense Appropriations Committee or the Armed Services Committee. And the lesson that I've learned over the years is that you have to stay engaged in these situations. Nobody likes it. It's long. It's tedious. But right now we have, so I would say we must be engaged in this. We must have our State Department engaged. We must have our military engaged to the state to the extent they need to be if getting a drone shot down for 130 million dollars because the president is distracted that's 130 million dollars that we could be spending in places like Youngstown Ohio or Flint Michigan Ryan, or, re- or gonna, rebuilding Congresswoman or Gallard, rebuilding I'm going to give you 30 seconds actually to jump off what he what said he will, described is engagement that what as you the will tell the parents of those two soldiers who were just killed in Afghanistan, well, we just have to be engaged. As a soldier, I will tell you, that answer is unacceptable. By the way, what she just did there, I think that's the most powerful statement she made as a soldier. Uh, and I'm not quite sure why. Scott Adams might have a better idea. But when she says, as a soldier, her <clears throat> just the way she looked on stage, the, who she is, you go, uh, your head kind of goes, if you don't know who she is, like, uh-oh, a soldier. <clears throat> the the search data, and I want to finish this clip, uh, <clears throat> showed that she was the most searched for name after the debate, even during uh, some of the debate, uh, like across the country. Now, it's a Google map, so who the hell knows? You know, <laughs> you can't trust anything, but we'll just take it as a baseline. And I, and I think that for her overall awareness, if, uh, you know, the show's general consensus is she's raising her profile to uh, take over Maisie Hirono's uh, gig. Um, I, I, I thought it was good. And to me, this is a, she needs to do that more often. Soldiers who were just killed in Afghanistan, well, we just have to be engaged. As a soldier, I will tell you, that answer is unacceptable. We have to bring our troops home from Afghanistan. We are in a place in Afghanistan where we have lost so many lives. We've spent 
so much money, money that's coming out of every one of our pockets, money that should be going into communities here at home, meeting the needs of the people here at home. We are no better off in Afghanistan today than we were when this war began. This is why it's so important to have a president and commander in chief who knows the cost of war and who's ready to do the job on day one. I am ready to do that job when I walk into the Oval Office. Thank you very much. So now, uh, Ryan is, and he had a look on his face, man. He's pissed off, so he does get 30 seconds. You felt, you felt like she was responding. You get 30 seconds. Very good, man. Fair enough. I appreciate that. I hear what you're saying. Thank you, Chuck. I would just say, I don't, want to, be, I don't want to be engaged. I wish we were spending all this money in places that I've represented that have been completely forgotten and we were rebuilding. But the reality of it is, if the United States isn't engaged, the Taliban will grow and they will have bigger, bolder terrorist acts. We have got to have some present there. As, the as the Taliban was Iraq. there long before we came in. They'll yeah, be and they there were, long yeah, before we exactly. leave. Well, we cannot were. keep U.S. And troops they were deployed to Afghanistan thinking that we're going to somehow squash this Taliban I that has say, been there that every other country that's tried them. I didn't has say failed. squash them. When we weren't in there, they started flying planes into our buildings. So I'm just saying right what? now, the we Taliban have an didn't obli- attack us on the, 9-11. The, the, Al-Qaeda the, did. Well, I Al-Qaeda attacked us on 9-11. I understand. I thought that was fantastic. Oh, well, that was good, but anyone could have done that because the guy's full of shit, that guy. But she's a soldier. Look. So he goes on with, yeah, the <laughs> Taliban attacked us. Okay, sure. The Taliban's <laughs> done nothing. They attacked soldiers over there. <laughs> but the guy's a bonehead. He's out. He's out. He's eliminated permanently for saying that. I like Tulsi. I thought she finally brought a little bit of fire. She needs to dial it up another 100%. And she could go somewhere. I know. She's not going anywhere in this election. She is going into the Senate, which is where she should be a good spot. Somebody's got to get rid of this other woman. I got to root for somebody. Well, you should have rooted for your old pal no, Julian. It's, it's not my old pal Julian. <laughs> and this and I find from a from an American perspective, this it this it truly is this all the Spanish speaking is is truly um I mean, why don't we just speak some uh, Somali? You know, there's a ho- whole bunch of groups we can talk to. Why doesn't everyone just get your Rosetta Stone and uh, and bone up on it? I mean, come on. It, 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 you, I find it insulting. I really do. It's just like, because I know who you're talking to. You're not talking to Americans. You're talking to Ill- illegal immigrants. People who are in America who are Mexican, Spanish, South American, they speak and understand English. No, you that was exactly right. That is the reason. I don't see why it doesn't make it even more transparent, the whole point of, of letting as many illegals in as possible. And then speaking in Spanish. Yeah, get him to vote you, and then you can kick him out afterwards. This is the kind of there was a there was a hilarious there's a hilarious video on uh, noagendasocial.com dot com. Yeah, uh, of uh, I think it was uh, yeah, of, uh, I think Castro speaking. Maybe it was Beto when during his thing, and there's subtitles which say. Uh, according to the Mueller report, <laughs> the No Agenda <laughs> Show is the best podcast in the universe. I mean, I felt I felt pretty left out, I and mean, I don't I understand kind of what he's saying, or what they're saying when they do this. But no, this just. Uh, I mean, I I could not imagine this happening in any other country, and people would be up in arms. Here's like, oh wow, he speaks Spanish. It, I think most Americans are actually impressed. Wow, he speaks another language. Yeah, that's odd. Yeah. What is that strange sound coming from his mouth? Maybe speaking in tongues. But yeah, the, the, in combination with with everything about immigration, then it's just it's clear what you're doing. I mean, and that's one way of viewing it. But ah, uh, you know, I've I've uh, I've been rear-ended by uh, by illegals in Austin with my truck. That is, um, I I I'm around. They speak English. They really do. Anyway. So I'm looking at some of the tweets from the Democrats. And it's funny how the Democrats really come out and they really take. You'd think they'd be a little in show business Democrats. I'm talking about the Hollywood elites. Mm-hmm. And they come out and they're just, you know, just pretty blunt. Seth McFarland. Candidates, please stop yelling. We are all on the same side. <laughs> What's the point of a debate then? 
Yeah. <laughs> what exactly? What's the point? Uh, Mia Farrow, all the topic being discussed by these candidates <laughs> are important. I feel <laughs> proud to be a Democrat. <laughs> Little flag. <laughs> The banker was saying, he said, he had an interesting uh, take on it. He says, it, and this is why he said there's no reason to watch it. He said, what Trump had and what Trump did is he took the two issues that no Republican would take on. At the time, believe it or not, it was immigration and China. And he just, because he, he had those two things, which everyone knows is common sense. Everybody, all sides, all Americans. And he just yelled those over and over again and forced everybody into it. You'll recall the immigration debate was forced by Trump. And that's yeah, so that, well, Trump takes credit for it. He's, he reminds us of that. Right. So, so, before me, no one was even talking about this stuff. Now everybody's talking about so it. So that's how you, um, that's how these days, a political debate, that's how you get the points, is you've got to choose something that no one else really wants to talk about and then yell loudly over everybody else. That's what Trump did. He took two main main um uh, issues and and therefore he he was he was the winner from day one on that and just kept hammering and hammering and hammering and everyone sees the logic of it but everyone's afraid everyone's afraid well there's also a number of people who said i don't understand why they didn't go after trump more even though they did a little bit uh jay inslee i said he said something that negative jay inslee by the way was the guy standing next to the right of uh tulsi <laughs> Yeah. He's the governor from uh, Washington State who has a one-issue thing, drum pound, which is uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. And he uh, he had a shit-eating grin on his face from the get-go, and he just kept it plastered on there. <laughs> so when you saw the camera angle with, with Tulsi yakking about something or even anyone down the row, and you saw a, a, you, they kind of nicked his face at, at half profile, but just the front. And you could see this dumb smile he had on his face. I thought it was like, so I mentioned this to Mimi. She said, oh, no, that's, that he always has a dumb smile. Oh, really? Just, what he just does. A, a resting bitch face. It's, it's just stupid. Um, anyway, well, I found the whole thing to be... Um, well, tedious, no doubt. It was a little tedious. Luckily, it was only two hours. Who, I think tonight's who, will be a little better. Now, who has the debate tonight? Is that, is that CNN? Is it CNN that uh, that is tonight? airing that tonight? Or is it MSNBC I again? I think it's got, it, has to, it has to be the same people. So tonight we have uh, Biden, uh, we have Bernie, we have uh, is Buttigieg on this one tonight, or is he not? Is he not? Yeah, no, he's on. The Mayor Pete is in trouble, man. I mean, I I don't know if you followed this the shooting in uh, in his town in his yeah. hamlet where he is uh, he is mayor. So there's it's only a, there's only about a hundred thousand people in the town, and uh, I actually have a, a little report about it. But the, the main thing is every single time they have video and audio or anything from Mayor Pete in this situation, he, he has his head bowed down. He can't really talk. He's almost like he's been like he's been gut punched. And and I well, if you listen to this clip, I have my reasoning as to why he feels so downtrodden. We have tried but not succeeded to increase diversity in the police department, and we need help. At home in South Bend, Indiana, Buddha Judge was confronted by accusations of bias in his city's police force. Y'all got racism inside of y'all police department. How are we supposed to trust it? I am raising a seven-year-old grandson that when he sees the police, he is afraid. That is not what's supposed to happen. Racial tensions flared last week after a white South Bend police officer shot and killed a black man who was allegedly holding a knife. The officer was wearing a body camera, but it was not turned on. If anyone who is on patrol is shown to be a racist or to do something racist... In a way that is substantiated, that is their last day on the street. Yeah, wrong answer, Mayor Pete. Buddha judge dropped off the campaign trail after the shooting last week. I just think it's my job. Um, I don't know if it's smart or not. <laughs> I don't know if it's strategic or not. But it's my city. Yeah, he's actually upset that he's out of the race. I mean, that's really what he's upset about. I'm just going to call it. He doesn't give a crap. I don't think he seems like a very ineffective leader. Yeah. Well, he. I'm gonna. I'm gonna call. You can call that. And I, you're right. But it, he never was in the race to, to 
any extent <laughs> except as well, a novelty. Well, it's one it was of a the novelty it, act. Yes, one of the and one I of the spook uh, spook novelties. Spook novelty. He, he's not in the race for president anyway. He wants to move up to the state house or this govern governor or a senator. It's just like Tulsi. There were these people, and I I don't know how many of them are running that are on this, uh, who I'd put in this category, those two for sure. They're just running to raise their public profile, get some free airtime, and then run for Senate or something else. It does the, uh, of all the candidates, is there a single black American? I think Booker is. Mm. He's brown, but is he, uh, is he ADOS? Or I is think he, he's ADOS. Mm, I'm not so sure. I'll, I'll have to look into it. I'd be surprised if he wasn't. Mm. Well, tonight uh, should be uh, just as dumb, honestly. No, no tonight will be better. Yeah. It'll be great. I think tonight will be great because they got you're going to have to deal with Bernie. Bernie will so, sorry. Well, well, I, Bernie. I wanted to play a little jingle about Bernie. An, an oldie. Play. An oldie. Millennials, socialist Jews, but no love from the minority. That's right, everybody. Bernie, Bernie, Bernie and the Blacks. Bernie's got a big black problem. Oh yes, he does. He's got There's a, no a huge that. black problem. I have a clip. Yeah, that's why he'll never. That's why he can't he can't win. Now. <laughs> I got another bunch of panelists that came up on NBC that talked about the debates. And I, I kind of concentrate on NBC because they gave the debates. They had people backstage. They had the whole thing going on. Uh, and there was – I've got three clips. But I, one of them is the most important one, I think, because they, they introduced – or one of the panelists introduced this term, which was actually brought up by – I can't remember which of the guys up there. Oh, was, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. The term is reproductive <laughs> yes. justice. It was beautiful, and I were. It was one of the panelists that threw it out there. It was Amy or I don't know who it was. No, it was they a dude. Kind of, it was a dude. It was a oh, dude. Oh, then it was uh, it was De Blasio. Yeah, troll room might know. Yeah, I think it was De Blasio. Whatever it was, here's a little d discussion of it. Uh, the at post the post show discussion. Yeah, post show. It is also related to making sure that you can raise your family in a safe community, that you have access to health care throughout that child's life and your own life, and that they can rise up the socioeconomic ladder. So it's a more holistic approach. And that was a radical moment to say reproductive justice in a Radically, debate. Yes. And I think, I mean, Hillary Clinton did talk about reproductive justice in the 2016 campaign in a speech to Planned way. Parenthood, but I cannot recall her saying those words in a debate, and that's a big moment. So what did you think, Jackie? I mean, did you feel like the issue, the women's rights and, and the issue around abortion was adequately addressed by the candidates? Yeah, I, I do. And I, I really did appreciate Amy Klobuchar's zinger back yeah, at Governor Inslee. <laughs> you all uh, called it mansplaining. Yes. Yeah, was, yeah, exactly. was there mansplaining yeah. going on? But I, um, perhaps a little bit so. Uh, he did make a pretty bold and not that he totally was accurate claim yeah. that yeah he was the only person to protect uh, abortion rights and which you know meanwhile there are there were three female candidates on the stage mm -hmm. who have also pretty much dedicated he their said he was the only one in the same le legislation yeah but uh, what i'm actually really curious is to see joe biden answer that question mm -hmm. tomorrow and yep. i was actually pretty right. surprised that biden's name didn't come up during that conversation because he is the one candidate who has been a bit behind the curve especially in the mm -hmm. conversation of reproductive justice because he hasn't seemed to understand that a lot of the issues around reproductive justice disproportionately affects uh, women of color are and you speaking hence, about the Hyde amendment exactly and you know there was that reporting that um his top female advisors had to to educate him on why it was important for him to change his well, mind and, and flip-flop <laughs> on the Hyde Amendment because it disproportionately affect communities of color. And I'm, I'm so happy to hear these white women talking about reproductive justice as I read from the Wikipedia on the subject. Reproductive justice is the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. And this is according to Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective, the first organization founded to build a reproductive justice movement. And let's see. Yeah, this is a, a, a all done by black women. 
they've set this up and they uh and it doesn't sound exactly the way they are talking about it the white women i hear here well it's going to morph because uh, you know we we've talked about this on the show and people should realize that we see the the difference and it's not my I, it was somebody else who brought this up years ago and as soon as they did you realize this is what it's all about the democrats are for i have two themes justice so they drop the word justice on anything. It's great. Right. Justice and equality and the Republicans are freedom and liberty. And so you'll see ah. in their literature, either side, you'll find a lot of references to freedom and liberty uh, on the Republican side or the conservative side. And you'll see a lot of references to justice and equality to the point w- which is a problem for the Democrats because equality leads to egalitarianism. Uh, which leads to situations like they have in Sweden where people don't understand that not everybody's an egalitarian and you bring in a bunch of outsiders who don't believe in this sort of thing and yet you have all kinds of issues. And egalitarianism is a serious problem, generally speaking. Justice is what it is. Uh, Freedom and liberty is kind of both kind of variations of the same theme. Well, Uh, as as you just heard that term, the way it was used, reproductive justice, could you sum it up in one sentence what that is? I mean, I I have it here, so I'm curious what you think. Just having heard that, what do you think that means, reproductive justice? What is that definition? I think it means freedom to to, uh, raise kids the way you want. Reproductive justice focuses on abortion access rather than abortion rights, asserting that the legal right to abortion is meaningless for women who cannot access it due to cost, distance, or other obstacles. So no one's using it right. They're just throwing throwing it around. Yeah, well, you're right if that's the case, because if it's just an abortion issue, uh, they're, again, though, the Democrats do this. They take the word justice, and they drop it here, and they drop it there, and then when they do, everyone goes, <gasps> oh, and they all get worked up about it. <laughs> and this is another example of that, but it's going to be in the in the in play. It's in now in play. Yes, and I believe it will become in play during the uh, presidential. Uh, it, the the Republicans, and one of the reasons I think we like to do this show and have a lot, of, we have a lot of Republican listeners or conservatives, is that they won't get caught off guard. I think a lot of Republicans and conservatives will get caught off guard when the. It's a strong this, term. It's a great word. Reproductive justice. Well, just, but just put justice. Yeah, ju- it's just to put the word justice anywhere. Yeah, podcast justice, people. That's what we need. Podcast justice. And then yes. when and when you hear that, you're like, shit, I can't refute that. Podcasters need <laughs> justice. You don't even know what it means. Who cares? Who cares? It. Podcasters need justice. Yeah. Uh, here's another thing a little bit more about, uh, I think that was the reproductive justice um, clip. Why don't you play the Joe Biden apologizing clip? These are my personal beliefs, but I recognize what the rest of the country wants others. and right. seeks out of right. me, and right. I need to try to meet the country where they are. And I think Joe Biden needs to sort of articulate that tomorrow. But how do you do that stylistically <laughs> so that you still convey this yeah. authenticity? This is why I'm not a president. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I don't think it's difficult, right? For Joe Biden, he can say, look, I'm a Catholic. Yeah. This is what yeah, I right. believe. There are many, real, at 70 plus percent of Americans consider themselves as Christians. So he's not alone. A lot of people have that belief. However, I do understand the importance of women's reproductive rights and i want to make sure yeah. that i'm on the side of women simple right but there is a fine There's line answer. though because when you, you <laughs> when you apologize once then when does joe biden start apologizing yeah. for everything anita hill or criminal justice times. bill well i would argue that know, some of the things in your list he does need to apologize <laughs> for. But, 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 yeah, I, but i do think that that's the trick when you have a long record it's like right. when you have this you know decades long record you're going to have a lot to explain and i think that you know the crime bill is another thing that's going to come up it came up for hillary clinton even though she wasn't in office. Um, but Joe Biden wrote that crime bill. And there's a lot of black people in prison as a result. And so he's going to have to speak to that constituency and explain, you know, right. I, I, I didn't see these for these circumstances. I didn't foresee it. The but, evolution, you know. Yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> no one's no. going to fall for that. I, 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 think- I didn't know how well, I didn't know that what the policy would do. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that he's got the same black problem that Bernie has. That's well, why. Well, gets, this is like, bringing in Kamala Harris. By the way, by the way, this is an irony. Mm-hmm. Kamala Harris is not respected by blacks, generally speaking. No, nope. uh, ADOS blacks. Nope. And but Bernie doesn't. I'm mean, not Bernie. Actually, Bernie 
and Biden, neither one of them know this. They don't get, have a clue. I mean, <laughs> well, clear, let, let's be realistic. Allow, allow me to play a clip uh, about Bernie from Antonio Moore from ADOS. What up, y'all? This is Antonio Moore coming to you from Tone Talks, coming to you briefly with a quick hit because I got no notification that Bernie Sanders is talking about forgiving all the student debt. Well, on one hand, you can see that it's totally commendable. If you don't give it context, you don't understand that this is the same man that has talked about not giving cash payment for reparations, that's talked about the cost of reparations. I understand that student debt is forgiving them one and a half trillion dollars in debt and primarily will go to white folks because of the amount of them that go to college versus us. Fundamentally, my belief is that even as somebody who has six figures in student debt, that you don't forgive that debt until you until you make your debts whole and regarding reparations. Don't give black families reparations to white middle class and white upper class families that took on student debt. It just doesn't work that way. I say to you today, what I believe should happen is that Bernie Sanders should come out in support of reparations first, that Bernie Sanders should commit to a $10 trillion reparations plan to be paid over 10 years, a trillion a year, only to ADOS, America. American descendants of slavery to make these families whole and should guarantee an apology for slavery if he, he does become president. After that, he can do a one and a half trillion dollar student loan forgiveness plan, which I'll be in full support of. So, you know, he, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, and does Biden support the uh, the canceling of student debt yet? Is he on, is he on the, the debt train or is he done? No, he has not actually. And I could be wrong, but as far as I know, he's not. And I don't think he will. And by the way, this is the one of the main figures of the American descendants of slavery. He what he's doing is YouTube from his car. And I and I said, I sent a message out, said, you know, you really should get on a stage. <laughs> this is not, this is not going to get attention doing YouTubes from your car. That is not how you get a movement. YouTubes from their car. It's not how you get a movement going. <clears throat> so eh, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> they don't need him. Got everybody else. You know, the, the student debt cancellation is, is beautiful. Eh, all the kids love it. <laughs> all the kids, except for the kids who chose not to go to college, who were saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Or, or the kids who paid off their student debts, mm-hmm. they're not going to be too pleased with this. That's the problem with this kind of you know jubilee or any kind of dead holiday. It's like, wait a minute. So I should have just been a you know a, a slouch and never paid anything, and I'd, I'd be home free. That's what you're saying. You're encouraging that. That's <laughs> why it doesn't work. Well, here here's what was interesting last night. My dinner with the former New York banker. Um, he schooled me on MMT which I know you've been looking into, which is this modern monetary theory. Yeah. And the idea is you can print a hell of a lot more money as, uh, than we're doing right now because it doesn't matter. And he made a very compelling argument, which I can't... He compared it to Japan, really. He says, look, you know, uh, what do you call the liquidity trap? He says, it turns out... And he, and he knows a lot. I mean, he, he was in the sovereign wealth sector, so he, not, he knows a lot about global economics. He said, we can print trillions more. It does not matter. I, and no matter how I parade, it, he, he had an answer. And I know you've looked into it. And you know, it seems that uh, unlike what everyone uh, from the, uh, the Austrian School of Economics thinks, that it does indeed work and that we, and we could fund the debt cancellation. We could put in another thirty trillion into Green New Deal. We could do some reparations. We could do anything we want because it does not matter. Your take, John C. Dvorak. Well, uh, I think people are looking at this are about modern monetary theory. They're looking at it from the wrong perspective. First of all, it's not about how much money is in, in circulation or anything like that. It's about income inequality. And if you listen to the people that promote this idea, and you can just draw, and he's right, it doesn't matter. I don't think it does either. Because, and it's not going to matter when it comes to uh, when it comes to the fact that there's an income. In fact, it may worsen income inequality based on the economic cycle and based on what the and this woman, I think her name is Slotkin or something like that. And she is the economic policy person for Bernie. And she's one of the big promoters of MMT. Mm-hmm. And she made this comment once and that's which stuck with me. And when she, as soon as she said it, I said, well, wait a minute. Oh, I thought it was just a dog whistle comment, but it to use that term. But th- then I realized it's not. She said income 
inequality was lessening. It was getting better. It was getting better and better and better until 1980. That's the dog whistle. 1980 is a code word for Reagan. Reagan, yes. Trickle down, trickle down. Reagan and the Republicans got in, and then the, the, then the income inequality got worse and worse. And then you, if you look at the cycles, apparently it was worsening just before the Depression, which is the giveaway. In 1929, income inequality, or 1928, it was horrible. And then the Depression came. 1980 is the end of another depression that took place in the 70s. In other words, these folks, their whole orientation, I have a presentation I could write up. Their whole orientation is, yes, put us into an economic tailspin, sink the economy so everybody's broke. Then you have no income inequality. It's all evened out. And I'm reminded of – the, one of the Koch brothers, I think it was David, it had a special on him on one of these networks. And he said, we were almost a bankrupt company in the 1970s. Everybody in the 1970s was going broke. There was no wealth whatsoever. I went through it. And it was, that's when income inequality, do, you know, starts to shrink. Of course it does, because everybody's broke. <laughs> and then 1980 comes along and it says prosperity starts to grow and grow and grow. Income inequality starts to grow and grow. And that's just going to always be the case. So unless you want to put us in a perpetual depression where everybody's broke. <laughs> right. But it's the Democrats who are who are saying this. So you'd expect them, the more socialist uh, individuals of our society, to want everyone to be depressed and broke. And maybe yes, they want that. But they, they do. But what they want us all to be broke. But what they're saying is the opposite. We'll have the opposite effect. Well, they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it didn't matter what I said. He had an answer. That's kind of his MO sometimes anyway. You've met him. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing we did agree on was uh, how awful the removal of the ordinance uh, rules in Austin is that now people can uh, pitch tents on the sidewalk. <laughs> but here's here's what he added to it. He said, although it's horrible... And uh, and it turns out that uh, our governor Abbott uh, he tweeted out that he was going to oh, he was going to make some laws to stop this. He said we can't have this. If any if any Texas city thinks they can do that, we're going to write legislation to stop it. Uh, the banker said, actually, having homeless living on the street or the unhoused is a sign of great wealth, of great wealth of uh, society, because we are so wealthy. But let's just say California, but we'll add Austin to the mix. So pros- prosperous that we don't care if people are poop on the street. <laughs> Go ahead, poop what you want. <laughs> Everything's great. So we're th- so his theory is that 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 is a sign of great prosperity, prosperity yes. and decadence. Yes, exactly. Which is exactly you're so decadent yep. that you don't give a crap if yes. people are pooping on the street. Hey, well, look, hey, let's get in the limo, Louise, I before think- this poor homeless <laughs> tramp, this pathetic soul, poops in front of us. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I think it is the term that, um, what is the term? We're so wealthy, we don't give a shit. <laughs> I, think, I think that's what it comes down to. You can do one on the street. And he has a point. Look at California. You know, he might actually have hit one there. I, I thought uh, it was out of the park. I, I stopped the conversation. I got to write this down. I can't believe you just said that. And even though we don't like it, it truly shows you in elitist, very wealthy society, uh, maybe uh, equitable to the Romans or maybe uh, the Weimar Republic had a lot of this stuff going on before everything well, let's, let's went crazy. Well, let's take some so- solid examples. In San Francisco, the poop uh, map and all the rest of it began after Twitter, Jack Dorsey, and the folks on there's they had a bunch of uh, porta potties near, not in front, not on the street, but near the Twitter headquarters in San Francisco. Yes, and it was and it was this oh oh we can't have these porta potties. It just it makes a bunch <laughs> of homeless s- surround them and they get in line and have to poop there. I'd rather I'd rather not see the porta potties. They're just a little bit too much for me. So just get rid of those get rid of those ugly things and and let the homeless go somewhere else. <laughs> well, the, the the sad part of it all is the only solutions that they'll throw out there cavalierly is 
We need affordable housing, which is just more money for them. <laughs> I own that piece. Let's put some affordable housing on that. Yeah, this is a good idea. And it jacks up the rents everywhere, moves people out, gentrifies. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't, I cannot get a no, wedge in a, it. I, I'm loving this idea of the argument that's just rich, decadent elites that don't care if anybody's dying. And for <laughs> Louise, was that a dead man you stepped over? <laughs> is he dead? Oh my! Is he breathing? Well, you, you, you kick him for me, Bruce, and find out. <laughs> Yeah, oh, so he kind never. of blew my mind with that. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm mind. all in on that one. Blew that's my exactly mind. exactly what's going on, because that's what we're seeing. Yeah. You and, got a Lamborghini dealer, and then there's a guy pooping. I mean, yeah. come on. And, and, and the wealth is, has gone to our heads. It's gone to our heads. Because the people who aren't super rich and don't mind this, you know, feel kind of powerless. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. Let me just not rock the boat here. I'm just going to, I'll just step over it. <laughs> yeah i'm fortunate i've got privilege and by the way most people pooping on the streets of austin are white just so you know how about uh just during the debates was there any green new deal crap because i got a couple clips from uh from europe that i want to share was there any, any- i didn't pick anything up particularly uh i mean they didn't really get into it they were mostly i don't know it, 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 i think there'll be something tonight but they didn't get into it too much. I mean, the guy who would have gotten into it was Inslee because he's pretty yeah. much. Oh, shoot. I just had an idea. I'm sorry. I just want to go back to the homelessness thing. It, it, let's just take it for true that this is the in- incredible wealth. And um, what were the what some of the terms we used? Decadence. Income decadence. De- oh, decadence. No, the pooping on decadence. the streets. Yeah, decadence. This, you know what this calls for? This calls for a reality show. You know, lifting someone from the street. You know, we, the, 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 the sc- people will love that. You know what I mean? It's like, your yeah, town could Pig be next Malian week. Story. What? Yeah, Pygmalion. You know, uh, my fair lady, you get some of these just... Trading horrible. places, trading places. Trading places. Trading places. That's it. That's it. All right. So, so, yeah, so there wasn't a lot of Green New Deal is what I'm, what I'm hearing. I didn't, I didn't see any, actually, in my scan. A couple of climate changes, maybe, but... Nothing well, substantial, it, but it, was, it wasn't, you know, because it, uh, yeah. Well, the, it, it didn't get, get. I mean, there's still the, there's still. This is what gets me. There's a large group of Democrats that are bitching and moaning about the fact, and they didn't want to bring it up. I think because they're worried about getting tossed, because they're not supposed to discuss climate change as a, as a debate. They don't want to debate climate change. Yeah, of course. So there's a bunch of Democrats that want to actually have one of the debates just be about climate change, and I'm thinking to myself. Who, what, what would that be like? Everybody in the Democrat Party is in on the on the whole idea that we're going to all die in 12 years. And so there wouldn't be much of a debate. There'd just be a lot of agreement and the head nodding. Exactly. Well, over in the UK, there's uh, there's a big push once again. This is all in the backdrop of the G20, which we'll talk about, which is taking place this weekend. But Sky News really stuck it to the British people with this little expose and uh, a new term or a uh, a term that uh, is being rejuvenated was introduced to the lexicon. In the 18th century, the Industrial Revolution kick-started economic growth and modern capitalism, but only at the cost of pumping out millions of tons of carbon into the atmosphere as the years ticked on by. From iron and steel production to coal and steam power, plants and factories and for centuries Britain was the only name in the game the world's economic engine the world's richest economy and by far the world's biggest polluter but just look at what happens at the start of the 20th century America finally begins to overtake us but these ever increasing bars tell another story the richer we've got the more we've polluted And it all comes back to the fact that we never put a price on waste. Until now. Because with scientists predicting a climate catastrophe, and with China pumping ever more pollution into the atmosphere, the greatest challenge of the next century is going to be managing this carbon debt. The debt that Britain started. (laughs) All right, Britain. It's your fault, first of all. So we're looking at you. Second... 
climate debt. I like this. This could be, now this is a financial instrument. Now they've finally done it. You could be born and the government could place a climate debt on your head. And you would have to work that off during your life. You would have to do things to remove your climate debt. (laughs) I mean, have you heard this term? I think I might have heard it. Uh, along with climate justice, using that term again, mm. um, as a as kind of a, they're fishing. It looks like they're fishing. They got a, these terms and they're throwing them out there. See what happens. Uh, yeah, I may have, but it, be, it would would have been a while back. So they're shaming the British people uh, into uh, into this climate debt corner, and uh, with that comes uh, an open letter from uh, <laughs> yes, an open letter from. Investors with $34 trillion worth of assets just ready to invest. Europe is braced for a record-breaking heat wave. Temperatures forecast to hit 40 degrees Celsius across much of the continent. For many, it's yet another sign of global warming. Now some of the world's top investors are joining calls for action. Money managers responsible for $34 trillion in assets have signed a joint letter demanding change. Together, they account for nearly half the world's invested capital. Signatories include legal and general investment management and CalPERS, California's public employees retirement fund. But the world's two biggest asset managers are missing from the list. BlackRock and Vanguard wouldn't give specific reasons for not signing. Now the letter comes days before a G20 summit in Japan. The investors call on governments to work with them on action against climate change. They support the Paris Agreement on Global Warming struck in 2015. It calls on governments to keep average temperature rises to less than 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Yet the world is on track for an average increase of at least 3 degrees by the end of the century. In Europe right now, it feels a whole lot hotter than that. So the way I read this uh, open letter is these are government, uh, quasi-government investors. It's not BlackRock and Vanguard. It's not the commercial guys. They're not stupid. I'm not putting my money in that. But the the California government employees' uh, pension fund, what was it? Yeah, PERS. Yeah. CalPERS. Yeah, that's, 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 that's like government almost, isn't it? No, it's a big giant. If you work for the state or regional governments, a lot of cities, I think even the money goes into CalPERS as a. It's like a. It's like a <laughs> retirement system, right? But they so they want to put your retirement money at risk in this cockamamie yeah. climate to uh, change uh, well, that's investments because they're in California and they're suckers. Suckers, Ugh. they're dumb. And then let me make a point that I want to just. I don't like. Uh, I don't like the Bill Gates uh, thing where you you make a bunch of rich guys pledge half their uh, wealth. The Warren the Buffett company. pledge. The Warren Buffett pledge. This is a you know I don't like. I never like. I really dislike Grover Norquist, and he had this piece of paper he made Republicans conservative sign during I think it was some during Bush's administration, and it was a tax pledge. You never raise taxes, and you you write this, you sign this pledge. I don't like people signing these pledges. I don't like organizations signing them. I think it's like you're. Why are you doing it? You know, don't you have you know control over your own future? Your own. I mean, why am I? Why would I be shamed and the same worth of a wish worth uh, ten billion? And I'm now going to be shamed into signing away five billion of this. Oh, that's easy one. It, it's dumb. Well, no, but this, and this it, it well, has well, nothing to do with all, smart. First of all, first of all, I do realize that, for example, I do remember when uh, Ted Turner pledged like you know a billion dollars to some university or something like that, and then he just reneged. You, you it, if you get worth ten billion dollars, you can sign anything you want and just say screw you and don't do it. And which, but then again, now it just shows yeah, but that that's, what it that's not you. what's happening. That what what's happening with those guys is different. You know very wealthy people. I mean, really wealthy people. I know very wealthy people. And people with so much wealth who can and have purchased anything they want, any kind of love, but they can't get respect from the people. So it's a virtue signal. They want to be liked. 
Oh, he's yes, like me. I, I'm not going to argue And that. I don't care how point. much money I have to pledge. Just like me. I don't want people to look at me sideways. Please like me. Yeah, I understand. And that's probably exactly what it is. But the, that's not my point. My point is that nobody should be signing pledges like this. And especially government employees who are si- who signed that Grover Norquest thing. If I got a, a representative it, it, working for me in the, say he's the state se- senator or whatever, I want him to be beholding to the public that voted him in. I don't want him being beholden to some guy Grover Norquist. <laughs> I, I think it's like, wait, what are you pledging to this guy for? You're working for me. Right. Uh, no argument there. Uh, final thing on the New York banker. He has, an, uh, he, has he said, oh, you know, he read some article, which he sent to me, which I haven't read yet, about some grid calculations. And it turns out that you really don't need that much uh, uh, gas to pick up the slack on wind and solar. There's all these grid calculations. And it turns out it really works. And you don't need I'm like, that sounds like bull crap. And he just was going on and on. And then we got into an argument. He said, well, as you know, DC power is much more efficient to transmit. I'm like, stop. What? Now, please tell me that's wrong. I mean, I just can't. I mean, no, DC power is not more efficient to transmit over lines. Is it? DC power is more efficient in a lot of things. For sure, yeah, in in your house. I don't know if long range transmission is one of them. I don't believe it is. No, it can't be. That's, for that's what range, Tesla yeah. and Edison I mean, you, fought about. Yes, and it had to do with transmission. I believe at yeah. the end of the at the end, at the of, end the of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, send, I'll, I'll get this. I'll facts, send you huh? that article. We got we got to deconstruct this because all of a sudden he's all in on wind and solar works and like and you know. That means someone else in the in the elite circles is thinking it. He's never going to take me out to dinner after he hears this. I'm not sure he will. <laughs> Just convince you you're wrong. Wrong. <laughs> wrong again, Curry. <laughs> and with that, I would like to thank you for your courage and say in the morning to you, the man who put the C in the climate debt, John C. Dvorak. And thank you, mis amigos. <laughs> in the morning to you, all the ships and sea boots on the ground, feet in the air, subs in the water, and all the names and nights out there. Yes, in the morning to the trolls in the troll room. That's uh, to be found and open and available for everybody at noagendastream.com. It's not just our show. We do it live on Sundays and Thursdays, and you can troll along and make really funny one-liners and virtue signal, do anything you want there. Um, Go ahead and bring it uh, while you're listening to the live stream. But you can do it 24-7 because there's always cool shows. uh, Different opinions, different topics. It is running 24 hours a day. Noagendastream.com. Also... In the morning uh, to our artiste uh, for episode 1149, the title of that was Couple of Reds, and this was uh, created by Mike Riley. <laughs> we had a number of choices. Uh, we uh, we selected the, uh, I guess I'd made a comment that Robert De Niro in that uh, Trump hate video looked like something the cat had puked up, like a hairball. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so he, made a, he made a piece of art uh, that looked like a, a cat, a giant cat that just puked out Robert De Niro. And <laughs> we, and we kind of liked it. It, it, it had yeah, something to it. it. It was good. good uh, piece. Of work. Uh, it's cheap laugh. We got cheap laugh. Cheap laugh. Now. I'm looking, by the way, I'm looking back at to get to some art for the uh, newsletter. Mm-hmm. And I realized that we haven't heard from Thorin. One Ooh, of our most long prolific time. Yes, artists. Yes, yes, you're right. For, I think he's overboard. Could be. It could be. I'll tell you something. I'm going to start finding, I'm going to see other ones that I've noticed that just kind of went overboard. Or or, or they stopped producing or they just gave up. So, I so, mean, Thorin had a lot of hits and it was like, uh, but he just stopped. I was, uh, I was out in the front yard yesterday and my neighbor Steve comes over. Now, as you know, we moved into this beautiful little area, small little cul-de-sac, and I'm not walking around uh, at any for any reason in Austin going, yeah, I got a podcast, you should listen. I, you know, it's like, uh, just, <laughs> I don't know what people are thinking. Uh, I do that. I, yeah, but I, you know, we plan to live here for a long time, and I want people to, you know, cause you listen, if you listen to our show for 15 minutes, you know, it's, uh, some people may get the wrong impression. So I'd never mentioned anything. Steve comes over. He says, hey, how was the the honeymoon? Steve's a Vietnam vet. He's uh, 
Uh, I think he's probably around 70, in his 70s, retired. And that was your uh, honeymoon. Yeah, it's great, right? Well, you know, I got to tell you, what? I'm a douchebag. What? <laughs> says, yeah, I'm a douchebag. I've been listening to your show. And I'm like, uh, okay. He says, I really like it. He says, I don't like Trump. He says, I want America to win. So a lot of people hate Trump, but uh, yeah, it was funny. You guys are good. I'm like, wow. How about that? Wow, the next door neighbor. Yeah, thank goodness. Because Steve, uh, I think Steve kind of cop, or he's the guy growing pot. No, the- <laughs> <laughs> yes to all of those. No, the cops on the. <laughs> I haven't approached the cop yet. She, <laughs> she's cool. <laughs> There's an Austin couple for you: uh, a police uh, officer and a heavy metal drummer. It doesn't get much better than that. Anyway, so the heavy metal drummer's the guy who came up to you? No, Steve is the veteran. Is the Vietnam vet from the. From well, the other side, a next door neighbor. I'm sorry. Yeah, is he a next door? Yeah, neighbor? He's, yeah, he's on the other side. Well, wait, wait. You got a cop and a heavy metal drummer there living together? Yes, that's the couple on one oh, side. Oh, this is what confused me. Yeah, no, that that's one side, and the other side is uh, the um, he lives with uh, not his partner but his friend, and that's also a vet. He's a Iraq Iraq War vet, uh, so I think they're just they just uh, share the house. But, yeah, well, but everything about Steve didn't tell me that he was going to, you know, hear any, anything back. about Trump and like it. So I just don't mention these things to people. Oh, so he's a, like a, a old, uh, unreconstructed uh, hippie Democrat? Possibly. Yeah. But not an anti... I mean, he went to war for us. He served the country. So he's huh. not, not that much of a hippie Democrat. But he, and I don't know if he's anything other than a, my neighbor and a nice guy. Then he's a douchebag. I said, no, Steve. You're the emergency contact for <laughs> for anything happening here. You're not a douchebag ever. There you go. Welcome well, to nice. welcome to the that's show, sweet. Steve. Sweet, yeah, sweet, sweet tale. Yes, thank you. Oh, uh, can you talk just a split second longer so I can go get the paperwork? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, and I'm kind of all. What else did the banker say? <laughs> uh, the banker didn't have that much else to say, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. Peppery. That's all I can it all sucked. I can remember. Peppery is what it was. Hey, I'm not, I I came to the I came to the to the meeting today with all my stuff in order, you know. I'm, I'm You know, you can you know it, I, th- yeah. pros can fill. All right, here we go. So let's go with uh, our number one guy today is Sir Not uh, Sir Animus. Oh, he's back. Uh, dog of bo- dog pa- Yeah, well, he's every month he comes in. Geronimus uh, of Dog Patch and Lower Slobovia, everybody. Lower Slobovia, two, one, twelve hundred dollars and two. What? Twelve hundred and two dollars. This is one, two, oh, two, holy oh, crap! Oh. Now again, we have no idea what the what the meaning is of this. Did he, says, did he send you a note with it? Of course, he always okay. sends a note. All right. Oh, we a love we love his time, notes. Not a long one. Oh, we love his notes. Uh, thank you to and the many producers that make this show the best podcast in the universe. By mailing rather than emailing, I'm avoiding AI flagging this statement as hate speech. <laughs> After true. all, it claims all other podcasts are inferior. Yeah, that is hate speech. It's true. It's hate speech. It's true. On a recent show, you discussed offering naming rights for Adam's new studio. Okay, here we go. This is what he's about this time. He's <laughs> want to give you a lecture on this. Oh, here we go. Naming rights are a complicated matter. Can the name be offensive? Can it be commercial, sponsored by a firm with its baggage? How long does it continue? A show, a week, a month, a quarter? What if two sponsors want the same show for their anniversary, birthday, or other special day? What is the minimum price for naming? Should it be more than a knighting, more or less an executive producership? After reflecting on these issues and on Adam's commiserating that dogs, dog waste, homelessness, scooters, and millennials drove him from the town center, naming rights seem superfluous. It sounds like the end of Austin. (laughs) All right. So this is now the Lower Slobovia studio. (laughs) That's what I'm naming it from now on. Lower Slobovia. I think we kind of nixed the whole idea of uh, of the naming rights. Uh, it was a fun thought for a moment, but I see nothing but uh, hurdles and traps. Yeah, and, I think and really not interested. Yeah, it is, his point is it's, well uh, made. 
let's use the word. It's problematic. Problematic, indeed. Problematic. I, we want people to, to value what we do and send us value for that, not for some advertising hustle. Yeah, exactly. We'd rather be poor. I would, at least. I can't speak for you. Yeah, well. Anonymous comes in next at 666.66. So we actually have two anonymouses in a row. Anonymous, Viking of the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't remember that. This, together with my January 31st, 2018 donation of 350, completes my knighthood. I want to be known as the Viking of the Pacific Northwest, Dvorak's excellent contrasting of Amy Goodman's domestic violence report <clears throat> with yeah. the public records and Adam's nuptials, as well as double 33 followers on No Agenda <laughs> Social, make me realize that it's time for a knighthood. I like cider and svid, oh. which is the Icelandic sheephead. At the round table. Let me add that. Let me put it in an order right now. Cider, Cider and, and Svid. Svid. <clears throat> okay. Travel karma for the Baron of Henderson, Nevada, and a big audience karma for the upcoming Salem, Oregon meetup. Huh. That'd be a good one to go to. Uh, okay, so we have uh, some travel karma okay. and audience karma. Yeah, I got it for him. You've got karma. Thank you very much. For your courage, see you at the uh, at the round table for the ceremony later on today. Uh, Callan Nistor, three thirty three thirty three. ITM folks, working on our asses, working our asses off here at the farm, and always looking forward to your next episode. Keeps us going. You hemp and beer is all we need. <laughs> Callan team at Lavender Blossoms. No jingles, but please play Drone Again at the end of the show. A million <laughs> thanks. Yes, well, I'll, uh, I, I'm going to... We don't have a lot for end of show, so I will play that. And a quick hit for you now with the karma. The Drone Again. You've got karma. Okay. Um, Sir Jeffro of the Rock Wall, $250. Hi, John and Adam. I just realized I haven't donated since attending knighthood back, uh, attaining knighthood back in December. Shame on me. I hope this donation will help with the sluggish time. Uh, June. As a cybersecurity manager, I love your debunking of the media's manipulation of hacking glitches and whatnot <laughs> and such. I'm sure the election cycle will give you plenty of opportunities to tear down misinformation in that regard. Yes, mm -hmm. it will. This is one of our special specialities. Uh, congrats to Adam and the Keeper, and I wish them eternity of happiness. As oh, for Jingles, if you can you. please throw a Manning money shot, just send your cash. Thanks. Think of the children and a little girl, yay, on my way to help me remember to donate more often for the children. Thanks for all you do, <laughs> Sir Jeffro. Of, of the, the rock, rock Wall. That's a show of money shot. Woo, Jesus. Woo, Lord. Look at that. That's a money shot. Kelly and Conway is a money shot. Just send your cash. We just need cash. We can't take that to the bank. bank, bank. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Wow. You've got karma. And thank you very much. Calendister. I mean, uh, Sir Jeffro. Sir Jeffro of the Rock Wall. Uh, we have Andrew Jones, Baron of the America's Mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, 23456. He wrote in a card. He had a card. Nice. Nice. Very pretty card with some ponies on it from uh, Blazes. A photo by Eileen Scahill. Uh, fine Art, New Mexico. Okay. Uh, Jeb and, and Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Another meetup in my protectorate is long overdue, so I'm organizing one. The details, who, all producers, slaves, donors, boners, and most assuredly, the esteemed assemblage of the round table. Where? Phantom Canyon Brew Pub, Colorado Springs, Colorado. When? July, July 19th, 2019, 6 to 9 p.m. Mutton, unlikely. Mead, probable. <laughs> Further information at noagendameetups.com. Napping for humanity now more than ever. M. Andrew Jones, Baron of America's Mountain, out. <laughs> I like the shorthand. Uh, it's on the list. We will add it to our meetup rundown. And thank you for your courage and for your support. Up for humanity. Did he want a karma? No, I'll, yeah, give, him. He didn't want yeah, I'll give him one. You've got karma. 
And that will be a meetup. Get it? Meet, meet, meet up. Meet up. Uh. All right. That concludes our group of uh, associate and executive producers for show 1150. I want to thank them all for making this show possible. And each of you receive a, a full uh, credit for your support in this regard. Uh, if you're an executive producer or associate executive producer, please accept this. Uh, take it with you. Put it places that people can see it when you display this. It gets you chicks. And dude, sometimes <laughs> <laughs> it's it's yeah. a it's a useful Woo! thing. I'm telling you. And thank you uh, so much for supporting uh, the work. And we'll be thanking more people in our second segment. And of course, we'll be back on Sunday with another show, which you can support by going to dvorak.org slash na. We break it down for you twice a week on Thursdays. You need to propagate. Our formula is this: we go out, we hit people in the mouth. Before we uh, move on, I, I've been meaning to ask you something for several weeks, keep forgetting, finally wrote it down in my show prep. Do you, by any chance, have a, a video of our vows from the wedding, as you posited at the time? Ah. Uh, yeah, somewhere. You have Because you told me you had the full ceremony. I do. Could you please get that to us? Okay. Thank you. I, I, I was worried because I heard that you were taking pictures, but you got home and all you had was a whole bunch of videos of like a second because you had left it on the video setting. And I was worried that maybe you just had one picture of the ceremony and no video. Uh, I will go look. Okay. I took the whole video. I've done this before. Mm-hmm. I've only, you know, a complete video. It takes, you know, 20 minutes, whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, I don't mind doing it. And I, I do have it. And uh, whether, I don't know about the audibility of the vows, but I think most of it should be in there because it was pretty quiet. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. It's appreciated. Yeah, I should put that aside. Yeah. What happens, I have this problem because I'm like a, when it, there's certain things I, I have a bad habit. I just start collecting stuff, so I collect <laughs> photos. I've never noticed this, really. And so you end up, so I end up with these <laughs> two terabytes of photos, and they're just like all these photos. And so then you, and they're not cataloged. That's the real. problem. You know what you need? You need a dead man's uh, switch. You need di- when when you keel over and it's all done. Just terabytes of shit gets released. Just <laughs> just shoot it all out into the ether. <laughs> just just a put bunch of put it all pictures. on IFPS, so it's there forever, can never go away. It'd be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that'd yeah. be beautiful. So every once in a while I delve into the thing, into the pile. It's mm-hmm. like jump into a pile. Mm. And then, holy, wow, who to, wow, that was a great photo. <laughs> anyway, yes. okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get thanks. back on that thanks, on the thanks, stick thanks, there thanks. before it gets erased accidentally. <clears throat> so you have a couple of things. Uh, so uh, good news in uh, the Queens, it looks like that nutcase Nutcase, not a nutcase. She's not a nutcase. She's just an extreme justice Democrat type. And she is going to, you know, do whatever what they do in these other towns. They're going to, you know, crack down on the police and make sure that they, they're nicer and let people poop in the streets. And just, who cares about <laughs> who are you talking or, about or shoplifting? Caban. Ah, that woman. The, the justice woman, in, uh, she's apparently one inch from winning. Here, played Caban In New wins. York City, Tiffany Caban appears poised for victory in the Queens District Attorney race. Caban, a 31-year-old queer Latina public defender, would become the first woman to hold the post. She ran on ending cash bail, stopping the prosecution of low-level offenses, decriminalizing sex work, and going after bad landlords, cops, and immigration and customs enforcement. Tiffany Caban claimed victory last night in queens well this is interesting she is one of the soul sisters i mean the Soros sisters i should say um and i i learned this from my buddy mo that soros in particular i know there he is the big evil soros but it's not a secret that he is sponsoring black female district attorneys all over the country and i'm not quite sure why other than social justice seems to be written all over them I think he also helped get the Chicago uh, DA in place. Well, 
these yeah. people, and they're not just her or black district attorneys, but there's a bunch of other ones. There are all these justice style. I mean, the Seattle's got one. We have one in San Francisco. Kamala Harris actually comes from that whole school. Also a Soros sister. And uh, unless you're doing it to um, to lower the price of real estate in an area, there's really no other reason that I can think of. Because real estate prices in Queens, which is a huge place, mm-hmm. is um, going up. Maybe it's, a, it's time to reverse the trend and turn uh, the Queens into a shithole. <laughs> well, I, I guess my point is... That's what's going to happen, by the way. It's broader than that. That's that's my point. It's like we may be turning a lot yeah. of places into a shithole. Well, <clears throat> but and it seems like these DAs are uh, chosen and sponsored for their, you know, obvious social justice warrior um, <laughs> qualities. Yes, absolutely. It's a great experiment. <laughs> you know how, Soros is, how old is Soros? He's like 80, 80 something. 80 something. 80 something, yeah. Well, being a lizard, he'll probably go to be about <laughs> 110. He's going to look so good when he finally changes his skin. Oh, geez, Once he sheds that old, that old crusty go. version. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Anyway, so she's in, it looks like. I mean, it's still close because Katz is the one who should have won, mm-hmm. the borough president. But I think these are also rigged somehow. It, yeah. Whenever you I mean, hear the name Soros, you can kind of think so. Yeah. What they need is they need some of that rigging for the women over in the EU. You know, it, it, I think they try again to, to vote on uh, their new leader of the Starfleet Command to replace Junker the Drunker. In the EU uh, Commission, right, and uh, so it's all about gender balance now. Oh yeah, you think it's just here in America that we have all this crazy stuff going on? No, nope. gender balance—that's what they're looking for. The European Union has a gender gap problem. None of its three most powerful institutions have ever been led by a woman, including the Commission, Council of National Leaders, and the European Central Bank. But now those posts, plus the top diplomat job, are up for grabs providing an opportunity to break up the boys' club. Yeah, I think it's high time. We never had a female commission president. We're totally lacking gender equality. I mean, even in the European Parliament, if we want to represent Europeans, we cannot ignore half of the population of the European Union. And it seems the boys are at least making the right noise. Oh, I love them. I love how this report... No, instead of men, oh no, the boys' club, the boys. Really? Can you imagine if that report was reversed? I mean, I hate doing that, but geez, I mean, come on. We cannot ignore half of the population of the European Union. And it seems the boys are at least making the right noises. Gender balance means at least two women. It's important for me to have gender balance Macron. in these nominations, that we have two men and two women. For Europe's most powerful position, that of the Commission President, currently held by Jean-Claude Juncker, Denmark's Margaret Vestager is in the mix. Currently, she's the bloc's top competition official and has made a name for herself for taking on the likes of Google and Apple. Other candidates include head of the World Bank, Cristalino Georgieva, and Spanish economy minister Nadia Calvino. But most names being touted are men, as the leadership reflects domestic politics across the bloc. Despite growing pressure for gender diversity, men dominate the makeup of most EU institutions. Of the bloc's 28 state leaders, just four are women. And the gap is particularly glaring at the ECB, where just two women sit on its 25-member council. Also, fixing the gender gap is just one factor of many in the race. Any deals must balance the interests of states and parliament, big countries and small, Europe's north, south, east and west, and political parties. EU institutions are also not only more male than the electorate, they're whiter too. (laughs) Minorities make up a tenth of the EU population, but just 5% of incoming lawmakers. Oh, it's going to be so fun to watch this. (laughs) <laughs> I think the Mar- Margarete for Schreiter, she's she's interesting. She would work. Yeah. yeah. Um, she and gouged uh, the United well, States is all she's into. One of the four women uh, leaders in the European Union is Angela Merkel. Second time now, she's got the shakes while standing in public. Did you see this video? No, I did not. So, so it happened uh, a week ago, the first time, and she was in uh, Ukraine. She started shaking uncontrollably, and it was, oh, no, she was dehydrated. Okay. Now she's on stage, and it starts happening again. 
uh, one of her her um, minions walks up, hands her a glass of water. She reaches out because she sees someone coming. She and she goes to grab. She says, "No, no, no." You know, I I guess she didn't want to seem weak or something, but uh, and she's just the whole trembling with her legs, the same thing. And and it's like, "Oh, no, no, just uh, nothing to see here. No problem." Could it's, be a it's, diabetic thing too. Something's going on, and it, you know why can't she just be honest? It's it's not dehydration all the time, and no. it, and if it's dehydration, she and you ref- and, that dehydrated, and you refuse the water that someone brings to you, it was the, it's embarrassing. Maybe she's got the DTs. What's the DTs? <laughs> That's an old phrase. A few people out there know what I meant. Uh, delirium tremens that you have when you're coming if you're an alcohol addict or even a heroin addict would be uh, DTs. Oh. So she's a maybe some sort of a she's addicted to she's an alcoholic or a drug addict and she's trying to get off it and yeah you, you, you got the shakes and she's seeing mice coming out of the walls and God knows what else is going yeah. on. Mm. It doesn't sound good. So there's a lot of uh, technology stuff we can talk about. Oh, maybe we just do this uh, E. Jean Carroll for a moment in the Trump rotation department. Oh yeah, if you want. Yeah, why not? It was it was kind of funny. Um, so E. Jean Carroll is promoting a book. That's, that's the only way you can see it. And, and, and CNN fell for it. She has written about her sexual trysts. Uh, I believe that's a main subject of her yeah, book. She, she, she might as well be Wilt Chamberlain. She makes it sound like she's screw, had affairs or either you had affairs with everybody or she was hit on by pretty much every major person you've ever heard of in your life. Yes. Yeah, so, somehow. So, and so the headline is, I was raped by Trump. But that's not her words. In fact, she doesn't even like the word rape. Uh, she thinks it has different connotations. Uh, I think she's a, a pathological liar. She may be a very good writer, but she's definitely just full of it. Um, and I think that this may have been... I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think she may have had her own fantasy uh, and whether it happened or whether she wrote about it. Uh, but she's promoting a book and they all fell for it. Everybody has CNN number one on every single they show. Want, they want to believe these things. They really do. They so want to just please give it to me. And of course, that it did not end well for Anderson Pooper. You don't feel like a victim. I was not thrown on the ground and ravished. Which the word rape carries. Even that, even saying I was not thrown on the ground and ravished. Ravishing is not <clears throat> the same as being uh, brutally raped or <clears throat> raped. Ravishing is the way I understand the word is more a term of extreme passion. But you know, so just to show you right off the bat, this woman is not thinking what Anderson Pooper's thinking. You don't feel like a victim. I was not thrown on the ground and ravished. Which the word rape carries so many sexual connotations. This was not. Duh. This was not sexual. For it just it it hurt. It just what it just you know. Well, I think most people think of rape and, uh, as a, <laughs> what Pooper's trying to say is it's supposed to hurt. Don't you know that? It just what it just you know. Well, I think most people think of rape and, uh, as a. I mean, it is a violent assault. It is not. I a think sexual. most people think of rape as being sexy. Mm. <laughs> Let's take a what? Think of the fa- <laughs> yes, you, wait for she it. She says that. Yeah, wait. <laughs> yeah. Rape fantasy rooms. Mm-hmm. As a, I mean, it is a violent assault. It is not. I a think sexual. most people think of rape as being sexy. Mm. Let's take a short break. Think of the fantasies. Mm. <laughs> We're just going to take a quick break. If you can stick around, we'll talk more on the other side. You're fascinating to talk to. <laughs> oh, oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> and you can just hear the control room flipping out. Here, I'll tell you exactly where where they start freaking out. I mean, it is a violent. Assault. It is not. I think most sexy. people think of rape as being sexy. Mm. Go to break. Go to break. Think, break. Break. think of the fantasy. Break. Mm. Break. 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 Okay, okay. <laughs> we haven't done this for a while, but I am going to give you a clip of the day for that. Because oh. that is just too hilarious. Clip of the day. But it gets better. It gets better. Listen. Well, I, it can't get Yeah, better. yeah, it does. <laughs> this is uh, 
here she is on the, the Joy Reid show, basically telling her story. So he goes like this towards the dressing room, and the odd thing is the dressing room door was open. Mm -hmm. In Bergdorf's, as you know, and on the counter were these fancy lingerie boxes that they used to have back in the 90s. Yeah. So I walked in right in front of him, and he shut the door and banged right against the wall. So immediately upon walking into that dressing room, right he attacked you. against the wall. Yeah. Right against the wall. Uh, many people, and you should have been included in this, thought this sounded vaguely familiar, this uh, scenario, this, uh, yeah. <laughs> this plot. And uh, if you are a Law and Order fan, Special Victims Unit, you might have thought this. Did anyone want to role play a rape with you in a public place? Yes, there was one, a bit plain and... It was not her fantasy, it was mine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ah. Role play took place in uh, the dressing room of Bergdorf's. Uh, while she was trying on lingerie, I would burst in. Hold on. <laughs> it's like, whoa. And she's written for a lot of TV stuff, so I wonder if, uh, if, if that just kind of crept in. But at some point, some writers seem to lose contact with reality. Mm-hmm. And they're writing, and they, I mean, Woody Allen has done a couple of movies about this phenomenon. And it's like the player, the people, the stories that you write about, be, you know, as you think they actually happened, and because they're so graphic. I, I don't know. I mean, I thought when I first read her piece that everyone was all jacked up about, they, they excerpted part of her book and put it in Vanity. Yeah, uh, Vanity I mean, the Fair. whole piece is just filled with Both. how she's, you know, get, having sex when she's eight years old and just all kinds of you stuff. Know, everybody wants to have her. And yes. She's the hottest thing ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, she's, uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. And it was a pretty obvious it was, and if you listen to the interview with her and Anderson, you hear a, you hear the kind of a, Almost borderline craziness. It's kind of exuding. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're fascinating to talk to. <laughs> your sexuality. It's in your DNA, isn't it? <laughs> I think rape is sex. It's great. Sexy. I think mo and but to say most people think rape is sexy. Okay, lady. <laughs> Alrighty. And I don't know. It's just it's it is uh, that's our media. Anything, yeah, anything to bring Trump it. down. Anything to bring him down. We'll bring him down. We got another rape, 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 rape. Go to TrumpRotation.com if you'd like to see what could possibly be next on the menu as we win, spin the wheel of it's accusations. All it's all in there. That's true. It's all in there. I have not been able to add a new one for uh, probably three, four, five months. Mm. I think the, I think it's solid right now, and I've numbered them. So now you can just go by the number. There's a, uh, so there's a number of technology things going on. There was a hearing um, which was underplayed, downplayed, was not really promoted. Uh, I didn't. I found out about it just by someone mentioned it on uh, NoAgendaSocial.com while it was taking place. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this, the Senate uh, had a, was it technology, uh, or what are they called? Algorithms, uh, technology companies and algorithms Senate hearing. Uh, which was, you know, C-SPAN 3, so not even available for most people. Uh, then we also had, and uh, I'm going to see if I'm going to find an order here, we had the uh, Project Veritas Google Insider. It's like, maybe we'll start... <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, maybe we'll start with some... That was a good one. Yeah, it, it, I, and I do have some comments about that. But I'd like to start with something that I came across, which... Uh, gives you a pretty good idea of how Google, specifically Google, really works. Um, and Portland, Portland, Oregon is, uh, has signed up to uh, Google's Sidewalk Labs project. I, we may have talked about this in the past. Uh, maybe. maybe well, the not. idea is they, they take a city or a portion of a city and they track everything, everybody. Oh, it's all connected Oh, we, we talked about this years ago. I think Toronto is their first target. That, yeah, but now it's Portland. Yeah. And, uh, and the idea is they're selling this service, the Google Sidewalk Labs, uh, and in that is a program called Replica, and they use it for city planners so you can understand how traffic flows and you know, other things for planning, for planning, for planning in the city. But I and I cut this. They have a video, and it's about four minutes. I cut it down to under two. It's 
if you listen to this in the context of what they're doing with us all the time and how they track what we do, it becomes a little clear as to exactly how beautiful this business model of Google's is. And as I've always said, it always comes down to location. That is the you know the keyhole data bit, the keyhole system that they acquired early on when they were funded by InQtel, the CIA's venture capital firm. This was very intentional. This is a true um, surveillance system. The whole company is built around your location. And when you add any little thing to your location, you're able to do quite a lot. And just listen to how they speak about this in the context of the Sidewalk Labs project. And just think about it in the context of advertising to you or any kind of behavioral modification, which is what advertising is. Replica is made up of two parts, a replica activity table, a database representing all the trips and activities by people in an area, and Explorer, an easy-to-use interface for querying the data and creating maps and charts. First, let's look at how a replica activity table is created. We use cell phone location data covering a small percentage of the population to learn about travel patterns and create a travel behavior model, basically a set of rules that represent how a person makes choices on where, when, why, and how to travel. The location data is collected by third-party mobile apps Mm -hmm. with all identifying information, like names and phone numbers, removed. Now, mind you, for the Sidewalk Labs project, they remove all that information. But Google has it. Separately, we use aggregate census information and other sources to create what planners call a synthetic population. This is a virtual population that is statistically representative of the real population. If 300 people live on your block, you'll find 300 people living on your block in Replica. And you know, you, want- and you, know <laughs> you know, this is exactly what Google's doing. You know that at my address, there's a replica, a replica of me, a digital me inside the Googles. 300 people live on your block. You'll find 300 people living on your block in replica, but you won't be able to identify any individual. We then give each person in the virtual population a travel behavior model based on where they live, work, and some other factors. Mm -hmm. Finally, we use computer simulation to generate a week of trips and activities for each person. Let's dive in and take a look at one person in the virtual population as an example. Now remember, this is now one person. It's a replica of you. They know it's you. They have your name. They have your email, your phone, your address, and they know who you are. A replica activity table, we can see this person is in a household of one adult and two kids. She lives in the suburbs and owns a car. We can see in the data that she drives to work downtown, leaving home around 8 a.m., stopping off at a coffee shop on the way. In the afternoon, she leaves work at 4 p.m. and heads to the grocery store. Sweet, sweet gig. She gets home at 5. A replica activity table is made up of millions of virtual people, each with their own home, work, or school, and a full week of trips and activities. These movements are faithful to real-world activities, but not traceable to actual people or specific trips. So they just have to keep saying that so you're not creeped out as a city planner. But this is exactly what Google does for their advertising clients. For for anyone who wants to do business with Google, that's what they do. They have a, a replica of you. This folds into the first and only piece that I want to play from this um, uh, Senate hearing. And the guy I have is Tristan, or Tristan, Tristan Harris. He is from the Center for Humane Technology. I haven't looked him up, but okay, think tank, some, something in there. I don't know who's funding it. Uh, but he talks about the concept of persuasive technology. And after you've you know, heard what you just did about how Google puts it all together, it gives good context for him explaining what, is, uh, what Google's business model is and how they're using it and if it's good or not. Everything you said, I, it's sad to me because it's happening not by accident but by design. Um, because the business model is to keep people engaged. Which, in other words, uh, this hearing is about persuasive technology. And persuasion is about an invisible asymmetry of power. 
uh, when I was a kid, I was a magician. And magic teaches you that uh, you, know, you can have asymmetric power without the other person realizing it. You can masquerade uh, to have asymmetric power while, while looking like you have an equal relationship. You say, pick a card, any card, while meanwhile you know exactly how to get that person to pick the card that you want. And essentially what we're experiencing with technology is an increasing asymmetry of power that's been masquerading itself as an equal or contractual relationship where the responsibility is on us. See, I, I like that. And by the way, feel free to jump in whenever you want, John. I like what he's saying. I, I like it too. I think it's really, it's really, obser- it, it's very good. Yeah. It's a good observation. Yeah. Because, because we all think it's fair and it's an equal relationship we have with these companies, but it's not. In the race for attention, because there's only so much attention, companies have to get uh, more of it by being more and more aggressive. I call it the race to the bottom of the brainstem. So it starts with techniques like pull to refresh. So you pull to refresh your newsfeed, that operates like a slot machine. It has the same kind of addictive qualities that keep uh, people in Las Vegas hooked uh, to the slot machine. Other examples are uh, removing stopping cues. So if I take the bottom out of this glass uh, and I keep refilling the water or the wine, you won't know when to stop drinking. Uh, So that's what happens with infinitely scrolling feeds. We naturally remove the stopping cues, and this is what keeps people scrolling. But the race for attention has to get more and more aggressive. And so it's not enough just to get your behavior and predict what will take your behavior we have to predict how to keep you hooked in a different way. And so it crawled deeper down the brainstem into our social validation. So that was the introduction of likes and followers. How many followers do I have? And that got every, it was much cheaper to, instead of getting your attention, to get you addicted to getting attention from other people. And this has created the kind of mass narcissism and mass cultural thing that's happening with, with young people, especially today. And do you see? <laughs> he's, he's nailing it. So we had that part. We, we tapped into your narcissistic side, which is still going on because you can have your video anywhere you want it. You can have it on YouTube. But the narcissist in you says, well, if I get kicked off YouTube, then I might as well be dead because no one's watching. Like, everyone deserves to be a superstar. Andy Warhol was right. In the race for attention, it's not enough just to get people addicted to attention. The, the race has to migrate to AI. To who can build a better predictive model of your behavior? And so if you give an example of YouTube, so there you are, you're about to hit play in a YouTube video, and you hit play, and then you think you're going to watch this one video, and then you wake up two hours later and say, oh my God, what just happened? And the answer is because you had a supercomputer pointed at your brain. And at the moment you hit play, it wakes up an avatar voodoo like version of you inside of a Google server. And that avatar, based on all the clicks and likes and everything you've ever made, those are like your hair clippings and toenail clippings and nail filings that make the avatar look and act more and more like you. So that inside of a Google server, they can simulate more and more uh, possibilities. If I prick you with this video, if I prick you with this video, how long would you stay? And the business model is simply what maximizes watch time. This leads to the kind of algorithmic extremism that you've pointed out. uh, And this is what's caused 70% of YouTube's traffic now to be driven by recommendations, not by human choice, but by the machines. And this is where it gets interesting. Because that they've obviously figured this out, the recommendations. If you see this deplatforming stuff that's going on, it's all about taking people off recommendations, not being recommended, because what they don't really know how to do yet is to truly modify your behavior. If you're a conservative and you're looking for conservative talk and conservative outrage, you're going to be drawn to it. That's just how the system works. They have no way to push you towards anything else, which is probably why they need to quarantine this type of stuff. And it's a race between Facebook's uh, voodoo doll, where you flick your finger, can they predict what to show you next, and Google's voodoo doll. And these are abstract metaphors that apply to the whole tech industry, where it's a race between who can better predict your behavior. Facebook has something called loyalty prediction, where they can actually predict to an advertiser when you're about to become disloyal to a brand. So if you're a mother and you you take Pampers diapers, uh, they can tell Pampers, hey, this user is about to become disloyal to this brand. So in other words, they can predict things about us that we don't know about our own selves. Were you aware of this, this capability? I never heard of this before. That's new to me. And if that's true, that's very powerful stuff. And I, I, I would be curious to know how they do it but and that's a new level of asymmetric power and we have a name for this asymmetric relationship which is a fiduciary relationship or a duty of care relationship the same standard we apply to to doctors to priests to to lawyers imagine a world in which priests only make their money by selling access to the confession booth to someone else except in this case facebook listens to two billion people's confessions has a has a supercomputer next to them and is calculating and predicting confessions you're going to make before you know you're going to make them and that's what's causing all this havoc 
This affects everyone, even if you don't use these products. Uh, you still send your kids to a school where other people believing that anti-vaccine conspiracy theories causes impact for your life or other people voting in your elections. And when Mark Andreessen said software is going to eat the world, what he meant by that was that software can do every part of society more efficiently than non-software. Right, because it's just adding efficiencies. Right, and so we're right. going to allow software to eat up our elections. We're going to allow it to eat up our media, our taxi, our transportation. And the problem was that software was eating the world without taking responsibility for it. We used to have rules and standards around Saturday morning cartoons, and when YouTube gobbles up that part of society, it just takes away all of those protections. So that's a long backgrounder, but I think it really explains extremely well what these companies are doing, and that it truly is about business for them. And I'm just going to push back a little bit again uh, with the most recent um, removal of videos, deplatforming, quarantining of the, the Donald subreddit on Reddit, all these things. People are so convinced that these companies are only trying to kill conservative thinking and conservative thought. You're missing the big picture. And that big picture still comes down to money. It's all about that. They do if if conservatism is seen as toxic, then it's got to go. But they they have no way to to change your direction. Not yet, at least. They have not algorithms. Their AI can amplify what you like, but it can't change your behavior yet. They're really trying to get that, and they're not sincere about going after hate. They really aren't. Here's proof. There's a startling revelation at a House Homeland Security Committee hearing. Democratic Congressman Max Rose of New York got executives from Facebook, Google, and Twitter to admit that none of them have full-time employees to monitor terrorist propaganda and hate speech. You all cannot get your act together enough to dedicate enough resources to put full-time staff under a building dealing with this problem. It, I think it speaks to the ways in which we're addressing this with this technocratic libertarian elitism. And all the while, people are being killed. Now, that came during a discussion about the tech company's failure to take down live video of the March mosque attacks in New Zealand. So they're not really sincere about it. They just don't they don't really care. They only care about what advertisers are interested in. And it, and it definitely goes for Google with their search results. They don't want people turned off and pissed off and turned away. But for some reason, they've convinced everybody that they're out to get you. And it's kind of pissing me off, certainly from no agenda people. You should know better. And then you get this Project Veritas, which looks like the biggest red herring in the world, with a whistleblower who's on a vocoder. Are you kidding me? (laughs) That's not a whistleblower. That's a dude in the dark with a vocoder. We don't know who this person is. We don't know what, we don't have a name. It's chicken shit. And it, and dramatic music and, and facts that you can interpret any way you want. Right after Donald Trump won the election in 2016, the company did a complete 180 in uh, what they thought was important. Before, they thought self-expression and giving everyone a voice was important. But uh, now they're like, hey, there's a lot of hate. And because of there's a lot of hate and misogyny and racism, that's the reason why Donald Trump got elected. And so we need to uh, fix that. And we need to start policing our users because we don't like to have an outcome uh, like that. We don't want to have an outcome like that to happen again. So the the things that changed was that in the TJFs, they started talking about the need to combat hate and racism online. And also um, at YouTube, they had the same like talks by the CEO, Susan. Um, and they, they, they talked about combating that and getting rid of unfairness. And so slowly they started introducing uh, the concept of uh, machine learning fairness. All right. So it comes down to this machine learning fairness, which so, I don't know. It's somehow people have misconstrued this with the machine learning is to take away all the all the bad talk. But no, it's not. They're trying to equalize the options that they present so they can move people towards a more advertiser friendly area of their service. But you but you can interpret it any way you want. Fairness is a dog whistle. It does not mean what you think that it means. And you have to apply double think in order to understand what they're really saying. 
And what they're really saying about fairness is that they have to manipulate their search results so that it gives them their political agenda that they want. See, I, I don't know about you, John. I just disagree. There's no evidence that this is only about their political agenda. It's people saying that <clears throat> without any proof of some, again, a, a, a poor, poorly edited, <clears throat> I won't say deceptive, but <clears throat> the the video of the woman who apparently says we wanted to fix it or didn't want to didn't want the Trump problem in 2020. You can interpret this in many ways. You can say we didn't want the Russian the Russian collusion. We didn't want uh, fake news. But this insider, the vocoder insider, chicken shit. I mean, if you really want to do something, step out there. Let's tell us who you really are. No, it's all oh, you have to be afraid because it's all for their political agenda. Bullshit. This is about money. And so they have to rebias their algorithms so that they can uh, they can get their agenda across. You know, to unpack everything that she's saying, saying that she wants to be she wants the algorithm to be fair to a, a, a hand picked representative of that community means that what she's trying to do is she's trying to sell you a product that is not objectionable. What she's trying to do is she's trying to sell a product that's not objective that doesn't represent the will of its users, but instead represents the will of a, of a, of a group of people making decisions behind the shadows. So this insider actually uh, flubbed and the truth came out. Did you hear it? No. Means that what she's trying to do is she's trying to sell you a product that is not objectionable. What she's trying to do is she's trying to sell a product that's not objective. Ah, no, you were right the first time. She's trying to sell a product that is not objectionable. He said it. Yeah, that's, and that's it. what it is. That's what it is. It's what is not objectionable. And here's here's an example. But wait a minute. Why did, why did he even bother correcting it to objective? What does objective mean? You know what in that se- sense? You know he wants to sell you a product that's objective. What does that mean? It makes less sense when he fixed it. To me, it sounded like someone doing a retake, and it was supposed to be edited out. That's what it sounded like to me. Let me just pick that up again. Let me do it over. You know what I mean? Yeah, pick it up. Uh, so here's the here's the, here's an example of this machine learning or machine fairness. Project Veritas also received a trove a of trove. confidential documents from within Google. This document is about algorithmic unfairness. It reads, quote, For example, imagine that a Google image query for CEOs shows predominantly men. Even if it were a factually accurate representation of the world, it would be algorithmic unfairness, unquote. <laughs> See, I don't understand what's wrong. It, 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 I don't know. <laughs> it, they, want, they want to show as many CEOs as possible. So I'm I'm just you know I'm just not buying this entire they, look tech is arrogant. This is all tech arrogance. Every single bit of it. But they've been caught with their pants down because they can't change the behavior of these people towards an uh, an, an uh something that is not objectionable. That's what they're trying to do. So they have to quarantine it, cut it off, cut it off, get rid of it, and it's misread and and this is a big problem is being misread by people who believe they're being uh, attacked and uh, and uh, silenced, and they're moving away. And I've seen this movie before. You've seen it too, John. You get enough. You get enough people. They're going to start moving to other things, and it will happen. And they're losing market share every single day. My hope is that they they lose it towards a federated approach. I've seen a a Reddit clone already, which uh, works with the federation, completely federated. Um, there's you know, alternatives to YouTube, as we talked about earlier, BitChute, etc. There's some, you know, these brands are starting to garner a little bit of a little bit of uh, uh, attraction, and people will move over to those systems, and they're afraid of that too. I think they're in a rock and a hard place. And here's the big secret: the internet is a network. You can do whatever you want on it. You don't need them. How many people actually voted for someone differently because of Google searches? Come on now. Probably none. Thank you. None. And, you know, so what is the what is the point of screaming and yelling that your conservative uh, uh, YouTube podcast, YouTube video, or your channel was taken down? You, what? You, are you there to convince 
people to vote for for a conservative? Is that your job? You think that's really working? You think that the sarcastic YouTube videos that people make, which are funny and it's great and it's in the and conservatives love it. You think that makes a difference? No, you can do that on bit shoot and have just as much fun. Everybody's some kind of social justice warrior these days, and the conservative right is no better than the than the uh, socialist left. And meanwhile, the guys in the middle are just struggling to make the dollars come their way. Yeah, that's why makeup videos are the real winner. <laughs> yes, they are pretty good, actually. They yeah. do quite well. Yes. Do you watch those a lot? I usually watch them just to find the good ones to send to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so appreciated. Yeah. So be on the lookout for, uh, for this arrogance. It's everywhere. Um, but to just be out there fighting and yelling and screaming and saying that, you know, it's a, it's a, they're trying to silence us. No, they're not. They're just trying to modify your behavior and, and get the, the good at, and, and remove c- controversy. Ugh. Well, I know. they also remove people who advertise within their own broadcast because it's taking money away from them the way they see it. You know, it re- YouTube reminds me of MTV. MTV uh, is, was the star, right? It was MTV is the star of the show. It's the channel. It's the brand. It's the big M little yeah, TV. It's MTV. the moon man. I want my MTV. They did not want VJs to be stars. They, in fact, that's why they you saw so many of them. They rotated them out all the time. What you're getting popular? Get the fuck out. Goodbye. All right, next. What you want more money? Okay, goodbye. 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 We, they want to be the star. YouTube is the star. They don't want other stars. And they're right. It's annoying. You got to pander to them. They don't want it. Yeah, and they get leverage. And, and yeah, and they make billions of dollars off of the makeup videos. That's what they want you to watch makeup videos and cat videos and your kids being cute. That's what they want. Yeah. And everything else is, is just delusional. Delusional. I like Steven Crowder. He's funny. Yeah, you know? and yeah, oh, sure. I, yes, there's a document where the Google guy says, "Hey, you know, the Shapiro and um, the Dave Rubin and uh, Jordan Peterson, they're Nazis." <laughs> That's my favorite. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then, and so, what? The, if you really read the document, what they say is we should remove them from the recommendation system. That's the only thing that's of importance in that in that in that secret Google group. Is they're yeah. saying we should we don't want them to be recommended? No, of course you don't, because that could actually screw up your business. Yeah, that he calls them or you know path to Nazis or whatever. Fine, it's, yeah, yeah, that was pretty funny, especially Peterson. Yeah, just um, a prof, you know professor of. Uh, <laughs> long, long lectures well, long lectures well it's always funny to Shapiro, call it maybe i'm not so sure <laughs> it's, it's always fun to call an orthodox jew a nazi i mean i see the humor in it it's yeah it is very funny there's something good about it there really is so calm yeah. down everybody and go find go to find other places do go somewhere else it is not Adam your job dot com find if you just you can write i mean adam loves by the way getting these notes so uh <laughs> <laughs> just keep writing to him. Anyway. I'm just saying that get your get your panties out of the bunch that they're in, and and stop screaming on Twitter. Unfair, unfair. In this case, I just gotta agree with with uh, with. I'll agree with the leftists who are saying it's a private company that can do what they want. How hypnotized have we become to believe that we cannot live without the Google? Oh, we can't live without it. You can, can live, live without Google. You can live without all this stuff. You can live without YouTube. And we don't run our podcast on uh, anything but our own system. Correct. Which is has, people have to be reminded of that. You don't go. I mean, you can find it all over the place because people can post our podcast wherever they want, and then it shows up somewhere. You could be on Spotify. I'm not sure. And um, but our mechanism is a mechanism that we do directly we use this you know a bunch of servers in uh, europe and canada cost it'll cost money doesn't cost us. well we're, we're <laughs> it actually doesn't cost as much as it would if you use Podbean. <laughs> we're very fortunate to have uh, void zero and bemrose we have, have some pros like void zero is a pro be, uh, be, uh, uh, bemis and butthead 
man, you're so rude about our guys, man. Oh, they're great. They love it. They need attention. <laughs> <laughs> no, I we, we <laughs> eat water. You know, you, yeah, why don't you go drink some water, and I'll tell you that it, we have Ryan Bemrose, who we call the program director, and Mark Van Dyke is the systems master of our engineering and stream management and wizardry. I got to meet Bemrose. He was up in a Seattle meetup. Oh, really? Nice, really nice guy. Yeah, well, of course. Th- these are all super nice guys. <laughs> all of them. You okay there, Chief? You don't sound so good. There's something else I was going. Oh, yes. So, amidst all this, I do have a, a little OTG update. Oh, yeah. A small yes, one. Yes, you have an OTG update. It was in the newsletter. Oh, thank you for putting that in. Yes, a little OTG update. Um, as I was, uh, you know, I, we moved to the house and I threw out a whole bunch of stuff, like almost all my stuff. And I'm, you know, I brought a couple boxes over, been organizing them. And I find an old. Why don't you auction your stuff off? It's probably all valuable. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. We already tried that and I failed. I didn't follow through. I don't want to auction off, you know, because you have to wipe everything and, you know, this, this, this dad is gold in them devices, man. So I find an iPhone 5. The iPhone 5 was the last iPhone that Steve Jobs actively uh, participated in its design. And was- Dan, I would say the iPhone 5 was the most beautiful one ever done. Yeah. It, it, and it was actually, it, it, the four had the you know now the four of course was the you're holding it wrong phone, um, which uh, was you know it was a weird one. It was released a weird a weird cycle. It's just yeah, I I agree with you. I think the form factor you hold it in your hand it feels really solid. The five is a little just a little bit bigger, but the five has some differences. It has the uh, LTE, um, so you have four G instead of the the four which had three G. So just as a lark, I fired it up just to see, you know, what was on it, what was going on with it. And I don't know why, but it started up in complete reset mode, maybe because the battery's been dead for years. I mean, th- this is a phone from 2010, so it's it's been around for you know, almost a decade. <laughs> um, so I fired it up and it starts off in, you know, new phone mode. I'm like, ah, what the hell? I'll set it up as a new phone. And with that, uh, I... Uh, set it up with, uh, and so I just create. You have to create a, an Apple ID. So I just created a phony baloney name and a, and a, you know an email address I wanted from you know which would be iCloud.com, and it set it up. And I f- and I found out that you can update the whatever. So I think I had iOS eight on it. You can update it to ten dot three dot three. Not over the air. You have to actually connect it to iTunes. So. I'm like, what the hell? I'll, I'll, let me see what's going on. When you have it updated to 10.3.3, you can install something called Privacy Pro, which I was reading about uh, maybe two weeks ago. Some guy found out that his iPhone, surprise, surprise, in the middle of the night was sending out 5,000 different pings because of all the apps that are in, you know, have all these, these frameworks and, and all these trackers inside the apps. And Yelp yeah. was apparently one killing of the worst. Killing the phone. Yeah, oh, killing the phone. And he, got, he says about a gigabyte of data a month if you really looked at it. And that's just what he had installed. So this Privacy Pro, uh, which I think is a subscription. You have to pay for it monthly. But it, is, it works exactly like the uh, pie hole, only it runs on the device itself. So it comes with a preloaded list of trackers, and at the DNS level, because it's basically it's a VPN, and so you're requesting, uh, you know, tracker.google.com. It's on the list, and so then it goes into the the bit bucket. It it never it never shows up on your phone, and you actually have a pretty decent experience um, uh, using your your product. What this gave me was the opportunity to look at what the iPhone is tr- is. Who it's talking to in its standard state, just the iPhone, no loaded apps, zero, except for this one, which is the Privacy Pro app. And it really only is sending stuff. It's it's pinging um, uh, an iTunes server. It's it's pinging the iCloud. So I just locked all those off, and just said no, you can, nothing. Apple can't talk to anything anywhere. And and now all of a sudden, here's a phone that does that has a 4G, which is what I've been looking for, 
does not talk to any outside crap. Now, of course, you can still be your local, even though, I mean, you got to turn off background refresh. You got to turn off, you know, turn off Bluetooth, turn off Wi-Fi. You want all of that stuff off because that's another way how they track you. You re- really only want to have cell phone tracking. That's the only, unless you turn that off, then you just have a, a phone that doesn't do much. And it takes incredible discipline to not load any apps. Because once you do that, then you're screwed. This phone is quite usable in this, in this instance. It will do email. It does it reasonably fast. It does text message. You got to turn off the iMessage, get rid of all of that shit. And I'm looking at a phone that I think is reasonably locked down from, from tracking, except for the, the obvious ones that they could do on my Nokia, with the benefit of a faster speed and, uh, and a web browser that actually functions. And I'm going to try it. Now, the battery is lasting, you know, it's already 48 hours on one charge because it's not doing anything. It's just sitting there. It's, it's work, the VPN is working a little bit, but it's a very, very nice product. And I think it may be the way to go. And I'm calling it the iPhone OTG. I think it's the way to go. And you can pick them up for 50 bucks on Amazon. The five? Yeah. It's not new. I mean, it's uh, refurbished, but who cares? It gets scratches on it. I don't care. Well, that's kind of interesting. Because the thing is, you can't do this with an Android. Because Android has all this shit built right into it. You know, who knows what Android is doing? I have some yeah, well, faith, I, kind I, of. I, I, with my phone, the Android, uh, is, which is an older Android, it's really not doing that much. In fact, as far as I can tell, it's not doing anything. Yeah, well, I wouldn't trust that. Oh, I, I have it turned off. <laughs> right. No, I, but I still kind of trust the old... If you have it turned off, mm-hmm. it won't do a lot. And if you have it turned off, the likelihood <laughs> of it being tracking or anything like that. And what I do is I keep my phone off. <laughs> well, you How know... How hard is that? When you turn your phone back on, it actually sends all your location up somewhere. It doesn't do anything. Yes, it does. It's been proven. It, 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 I turn it on to make a call. Oh, you're sure? And it can send whatever it wants at the point I'm making the call from. Maybe they'll send a, a AAA truck over. Uh, and then I turn it off again. I don't, need, Unless, I don't carry around a, a hot phone it, that's beeping away in my pocket and irradiating John, my nuts. John, unless you physically remove the battery, your phone's not off. Yeah, well. And this old dog, I'm pretty sure it is. I'm going to show my support by donating to No Agenda. Imagine all the people who could do that. Oh, yeah, that'd be fab. Yeah, on No Agenda in the morning. And we do have a few people to thank for uh, today's show, 1150. Starting with Patrick Weingard, who's in Zeeland, Michigan, $119. And he wants to, he's going to be wishing his beautiful wife, Jubilee. A happy birthday. Oh, very nice. Bob Maple, 111.11, needs a de-douching. You've been de-douched. Sir Hey Moose, $100. Uh, parts unknown. Sir Anthony of Philadelphia, in Philadelphia. Uh, oh, you've got some pronunciation things for me, $100. He says, uh, pronunciation guide. Uh, shul kill is school coal. Ah, I don't know that, Mm-mm. and I'll never get that right. I don't know how many people we have from school coal, but uh, <laughs> we should have more. We can have more, and I can say school coal. School-col. I'm gonna have to put a, a sheet up on the wall, and then pass junk is pa shunk. P a s s y u n k is pa shunk. Hmm. And by the way, I will read these pronunciation gaz- gazetteers uh, if you want to provide them to me. And it's all it's interesting to the public at large because school is not something I would normally pronounce correctly. Now, who, who would? <laughs> it's very educational. But I can't pronounce Pwallop uh, in Washington State and uh, Wairika and La Jolla. Bill Johnson, $72. Uh, Need some travel karma? We'll put that at the end for you. <clears throat> Gordon Gibson in Dallas, Texas, sixty-nine, sixty-nine. Uh, any possibility of getting an analog synthesizer de-douching? He needs a de-douching. We can do that. I don't know about an analog. Uh, do we have that? 
I don't know what he's talking about. You've been de-douched. you got to help me out. I have no idea what that is. I don't was. know. Corey Bennett in Hercules, California, $69.33. He's got a birthday call for somebody. Uh, he's a, for his smoking hot girlfriend, Ms. Kim. All righty. Ian Abbott in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Manitoba, 60. Uh, first time donor. He, he needs a de douche. We got a lot of first timers in here. You've been de douched. Uh, he needs some, he's got some requests. We'll give him a, a karma at the end. Gabe Shabazz. Well, also, <clears throat> also, for the for the new donors, for the new timers, um, due to brevity and just reasons of length, and we want to still do a show, <clears throat> although these, these segments are often entertaining and informative, uh, we really only promise to read full notes from associate uh, executive producers and executive producers. We pick stuff up from time to time uh, in, the, in the lower regions, but uh, you know, it, it's not always that easy, so we just kind of move through it. I did pick up this from his note, though, and if you have your pen, I would put this in the list because it got missed. Okay. Birthday shout out to his father Grant. 60, 60th last Tuesday. Uh I think he's on the list actually. Oh, well it should be in yellow. It is in yellow. <clears throat> it is? Yep. Well do it is it the same yellow as Kim Thompson? No, it's not. It seems to be a lighter shade of yellow. I wonder what the point of that is. Ian uh, Ian Abbott in Winnipeg. Okay, we just did him. Gabe Shabazian in San Francisco, California, 60. We need some relative in the hospital karma. We'll do that for you. Uh, Kim Thompson in Thornton, Colorado, 53. Another birthday call. What is this birthday day? We had none the other day. Now we have one after the other. It's a, it's a, it's a baby boom. Eric. Oh, wait. Also, uh, hold on. Uh, this is Kim. Happy with my husband, Patrick, July 5th. And no, the fireworks aren't just for your birthday. Please deduce him as he's listened to your show for years, still hasn't contributed. So his wife of 25 plus years is doing it. And Happy- then having him deduce, that's not actually the, the, the kosher. <laughs> Happy birthday, T-Bone, from your lunch lady wife. Now I'm going to do it. That's a great donation. You've been deduced. <laughs> 25 years, and they never had a fight. Okay, I got Eric Reichels and Brielle, 5150. My first donation to the best podcast in the universe. He doesn't ask for it, but well, I think he, he deserves it. No, 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 too late. <laughs> You've been de I'm in a de-douching mood today. Rich Semmel in Hillsboro, North Carolina. He has a, he has a note I want to read. Uh, wrote something in. Uh, there was a couple of things that came. I got my hat. What hat? It, from uh, Amazon. What hat is this? Uh, this was, uh, oh yeah, I think we put this on. There's a Father's Day donation there from Semmel, and he, uh, there's not much there, but I did get a, some other stuff. Well, I get, I'll get to it. I think it's going to be in this list. But I did get my hat, my make uh, Keep America Great hat. And it came with a little thing inside, a little note from uh, Amazon. This is a gift for you, J-C-D-K-A-G-M-W-G. And that's what it, that's it. I, yeah. So I don't know who's, whoever sent the hat. I think they mentioned it in a, a couple of notes ago, last show. Carl Schneider, $51. Uh, Patrick mm, by Bijkirk, I think. Oh, oh that's a t- Dutch name, so it'd be... Uh, it'd be, you can do by it. Kirk. <laughs> by Kirk, by Kirk, by Kirk, which is the, it's the, part. it's kind of the church next door. By Kirk, I think, yeah. uh, 51. And also Emma Bloomer from Pittsburgh. And she sent a note in. That's the one I wanted to look at. She sent a nice little note and closes the late gift from the Pittsburgh meetup. Hopefully then with some cookies. <laughs> and uh, then she sent this note in. Uh, or she sent this book, a small little book. And I'm thinking, I've got this book, and it's a book of, well, there's not a lot in here. There's quite a bit, actually. It's a little, one of these uh, <clears throat> Moleskine books, the rubber band. And it's got notes from the me that people wrote into the book. Thanks for saying Washington like we do. Oh, how cute is that? Yeah, from Jen, <clears throat> Jen Stockdale wrote a little note. Uh, Ryan Rolando, Bob Ryan, Joel. 
Ah, uh-huh. yeah, I'm supposed to have one of these too, I think. I never heard this. Yeah, I think there was two notebooks and they sent one to me as well, which I haven't received. But maybe oh, they yeah, sent maybe it to... because it just says, hi, John, hi, John. Yeah, hey, John. I, I think they sent mine to the P.O. box. I'll have to go take a look. Ryan, uh, it's Mitlo. My last name is Mitlo. Love the show. Hate the pronunciation of my name. <laughs> <laughs> JCD, there are loose swollen uh, Amy amygdalas. Are, there are less swollen amygdalas here. Sorry for the bad penmanship. Drunk something. Sir Fahrenheit was there. Sir Ryan J. Brady, Knight of the Three Rivers, is there. And so I'm thinking, well, maybe uh, – and it goes on. There's a couple more. There's quite a few. Emma wrote a note. Yeah, it was, it was a good meetup. I know. It was a good, it was a great meetup. Now, I'm thinking we should ha- we should start doing this ourselves, you and I. So, or, or have one of these notebooks like this one. When you get yours, you can do the same thing. Just keep this notebook, try not to lose it, and bring it to future meetups and just pass it around. Or I kind of like the idea of having a notebook per meetup. Like a scrapbook. We could be scrapbookers. We yeah, but that's put the problem pictures. is this is a moleskine thing. It's got like maybe 300 pages in it, and there's oh. like six pages of notes, so it's like a wasted little book. One notebook <laughs> per meetup. Okay. I don't know. Maybe it should just be online. We should just give up on the idea. <laughs> I like the physical product, though. It'll stay around for a long time. hundred Jonathan years from now. Evans is next on the list at $50.50. Then we go to Scott, uh, Sir Scott Nelson in Melbourne, Florida, $50.01. He always wants to be up there like that. And now $50 donors, name and location, if applicable, Jesus Allen in Austin, Texas. Jesus. The Joe Winky in Santa Rosa, Maxine ah. Waters gravels back. Joe, ba- uh, Joe Bambo. Don't forget to travel with your gravel. Toodles. <laughs> well, note there. Toodles, Maxine Waters gravel. Uh, Jeffrey Zellen in Oakland, Michigan. Uh, Jan uh, Osifius, Osifius in Osifius in Ustvern. Yeah, this is not a. I think it may uh, young. Uh, I don't think this is his right. His correct last name. Because I think the I and the U, it would be Osipaus. I don't know. Jan in Ostforna. Okay. Send me a note, Jan. Let me see if we can get your name right. Uh, Peter, Sir Peter Totes in Sugarland, Texas. That's right. Uh, Julian Roberts in Aptos, California. Charles Eves, parts unknown. Richard Gardner, who's, I think he's in New York, but he's one of uh, Sir Richard. Uh, Darren Denek, 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 uh, Denekowitz. There you go. Uh, in Dubai. We need a report. Take photos. Uh, Mitchell Kaufman in Hillsboro, Oregon. And last but not least, Annie Breglia. A great show on Sunday. She says, oh, I had just had to donate. I had to donate. <laughs> yes, you did, Annie. And there she did. She did donate. And she's our last uh, uh, producer that listed on show 1150. We did have other people, obviously, that came in with under amounts. But we want to thank these folks for making this show happen. Yes. And everyone who came in under $50 on our subscriptions, this is uh, very, very helpful to the show. Um, But again, it always stands. The general idea of value for value is you listen to this. Did you get anything valuable from it? How much was it worth to you? You make the determination. And we've been doing this for 11 years and we're still here. It's called Podcast Justice. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much. And remember, we have another show on Sunday. Dvorak.org. Slash N-A. Now, lots of different karmas to do here. Jobs, 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 and jobs. Let's vote for jobs. You've got (laughs) karma. Well, you're right, John. It is quite a birthday list for today. Not the longest we've had, but this is the 27th of June, 2019. Rich Semmel celebrated uh, on the 24th. We say happy birthday to him. Patrick Weingard, happy birthday to his beautiful wife, Jubilee. Corey Bennett, happy birthday to his smoking hot girlfriend, Miss Kim. Ian Abbott, uh, happy birthday to his dad, Grant, uh, who turned 60 on June 25th. And Kim Thompson says happy birthday to her husband, T-Bone, Sir Patrick, who will be celebrating on July 5th. Happy birthday from everybody here at the best podcast in the universe. It's your yeah. We have the meetups. Oh, I need to get that meetup jingle in the right what about spot. What our nightings? Well, I'm doing meetups first. Oh. If you want to run the show, you get to determine how it goes. No, no. Meetup. Meetup.
I like to mix it up a little bit. You know, save the best for last. Meetups for you uh, today in Southeast London. They're probably uh, hanging out there as we speak. Hello, slaves. Tomorrow in Salem, Oregon, June 29th, we have two, South Florida and Linden, Michigan. So that's a new entrant. July 4th, Seattle and Washington, D.C., two meetups. We're really kicking ass with these meetups everywhere. July 6th in Utrecht in the Netherlands, Knoxville, Tennessee, July 9th, Charleston, I want to, is it, I don't know if it's one of the Carolinas. I need to, that's not helpful. I need to talk to the back office. Uh, that's July 11th in Charleston. We'll find out which Charleston. July 13th, Atlanta, Georgia. July 19th, Colorado Springs, Colorado. The 20th, Southwest London uh, kicks in. July 26th, St. Louis, Missouri. July 27th, Buffalo, New York, and Frisco, Texas. And on the 20th, oh, the 27th, we have Frisco, Texas. So we have added Buffalo, New York to that list. Go find uh, the meetup near you you at noagendameetups.com if you don't have one you can make one you can set one up and we'll help you we'll give you support uh, of course the website is fantastic um and uh, and john can people uh, get emailings out if necessary or how are you handling that yeah it depends it depends if you have a big meetup coming up we can do a special mailing for you in a little localized area within 150 miles Okay, so, um, and all of the, that information, noagendameetups.com, and thank all of you for your courage. Now, we've got our two uh, nightings. We have uh, Anonymous and Keith Gibson. I need a sword. Here you go. No, oh, the long blade. Very nice. There's mine. Perfect. So, Anonymous and Keith Gibson, both of you step up to the podium, please, because it is time for you to join that illustrious group. It is the No Agenda Knights and Dames of the Round Table. Uh, thanks to your support of the show and the amount of $1,000 or more, I'm very proud to pronounce to Kate the Sir Keg of the Spring and Sir Viking of the Pacific Northwest. Gentlemen, for you, we have Hookers and Blow, Rent Boys and Chardonnay, Cider and Svid. We've got uh, Zucchini and Meatloaf, Bourbon and Bong Rips. we got uh, Harlots and Halbell, Pepperoni Rolls and Pale Ales, Bong Hits and Bourbon, Geishas and Sake, Mutton and Mead is the last one, but Breast Milk and Pablum could work for you, or Sparkling Cider and Escort. Please take this, uh, this coveted status and go to noagendanation.com slash rings. That's where you can uh, uh, input all of your info so Eric DeShill can get your signet ring. It's a beautiful No Agenda in the morning ring uh, in mirror script so you can use the included sealing wax to seal your letters of importance, but also to leave a lasting impression of those you hit in the mouth. And uh, thank you again for all the support. Dvorak.org slash NA. Beautiful. Thank you. All right, we got a couple. Oh, this is big news. Finally, one state finally had the gall. Well, here, play this. Marijuana is now legalized in Illinois. Hmm. Back in the U.S., Illinois has become the 11th state to legalize recreational marijuana after Democratic Governor J.B. Pritzker signed a bill Tuesday allowing for the possession and purchase of small amounts of the drug. The legislation will pardon anyone with a nonviolent marijuana conviction under 30 grams. Individuals can petition the court to vacate convictions that exceed 30 grams. Nearly 800,000 marijuana-related cases could be expunged wow. thanks to the new law. The bill also says that's a program to invest in communities most affected by the war on drugs. Illinois is the first state to both legalize marijuana and set up a marketplace through the state legislature. The law will go into effect on the first day of 2020. No, yeah. congratulations. A couple of things to note. <laughs> yes. One, yeah. 800,000 people and, you know, that got arrested or busted for pot. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. But the second thing was this is the only state that did it through the legislature. They didn't have a public vote. Oh, we got a yes, no on this proposition or whatever. Oh, no, this was just a, the legislature said, okay, well, let's get, jump on board. Uh, we're broke. Let's maybe some tax monies here we can collect. Uh, we're legalizing it starting on the 1st of January in 2020. I thought that was uh, commendable. Now, uh, oh, that is interesting. You're right. I, I don't think it's ever, yeah. It hasn't gone through legislature anywhere, and I guess not. No, it's always been a public vote. Good on you, Illinois. Just to confirm what the public wanted. Yeah. And, of course, nobody mentions this on the mainstream media. Well, why would we do that? we got to sell big pharma, not this grow-it-yourself stuff. We can't have people people using actual medicine that works. That's no good. 
So I, meanwhile, of course, they've banned the e-cigs in San Francisco. I did have a, finally got a report on it, and San it's only Fr- sales. Yes, sales. Sorry, here we go. San Francisco is set to become the first U.S. city to ban the sale of e-cigarettes. City officials unanimously voted in favor of the ban Tuesday, and Mayor London Breed has indicated she'll sign off on it. The ban also applies to flavored tobacco products. Proponents of the bill say e-cigarettes have not been properly assessed by the Food and Drug Administration for safety. The spread of vaping among young people in recent years has raised concerns about the long-term health effects of the products. Opponents of the bill say the ban could cause people to turn back to conventional cigarettes. Jewel, the most popular producer of e-cigarettes, is headquartered in San Francisco. Yeah, so I, I don't know exactly what's going on with this, but to me it seems like this is the way you shore up the official the official product and official maker of the product and cut out everybody else who built the entire industry. That's what this is about, in my opinion. It could be. No, what do you mean it could be? You got to, well, where they've stopped all sales of everything, including the Jewel product. Yeah, but only briefly, so that they can get the you know, so Jewel can fund the research. That's how it works with the FDA, and they bought the company. You know, the the the, the owners of Marlboro uh, bought Jewel for what was it seven or eight billion dollars? It was some crazy amount of money. Uh, they want to be the rulers. They want to set the 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 agenda for the entire United States. And uh, they are going to do this by um, by screwing everybody over, the people who built the industry. Yeah. And then... And, is, is this a shocker to you? Are you shocked? No, but I'm just telling you what it is. It's uh, I'm not shocked. I'm, uh, I hate this. I hate to... Uh, this, this was you a, hate big business? You hate big business? Yeah, I do, kind of. I hate big mm. business with uh, entwined with government, which is what we're talking here. Ah. That's what I hate. Yeah, that's a, called corporatism. Yeah, it's uh, also fascism, called fascism. Fascism. Sort of fascism. Fascism would be the better uh, better term. Yeah, that's exactly it. Shut up, slave. You will smoke what we tell you to smoke. Don't make your don't make your own e juice. Shut up. <laughs> Tyranny. Yeah. Shut up. E juice. E juice. Speaking of e juice, in Austin, Pride Month continues. Houston's Pride Week celebrations are in full swing right now, celebrating the LGBTQ community. And now, one nine year old is living near Austin, performing as a drag queen to promote inclusiveness. <laughs> Keegan performs in drag as Queen Kiki. A third grade teacher asked her class what they wanted to be when they grow up. Keegan wrote in his memory book, Gender Creative. Keegan says that he can be himself when he He's wearing a dress. He also has a message for anyone struggling with their identity. I want the world to know that you can be special and you can be who you want to be. You can be a vegetarian. You can even be a veterinarian. You can be LGBTQ. You can be a drag queen. Drag king. Now, Keegan usually goes by the pronouns he and his. His family says that Keegan has acceptance and support at their school in their conservative Christian town outside of Austin. Yeah, arrest these parents right now <laughs> with your memory book. I mean, it, the story was okay until you hear the kid talk and then you hear the programming. You can be whatever you want to be, a veterinarian. Yeah. yeah. I'm surprised he wasn't all in for some global warming stuff. He was programmed. Somebody was bragging about. We busted the, you know, the the, the school that Gore put together to propagandize poor eleven year olds whose brains not even working right in any real way. And then, uh, Chris, then I ran into one where the right wingers are doing the same thing. So I mean, it feels like to get a hold of these kids and then brainwash them at, at an early age. It's really deplorable. I th- yes, and you know. There's, it's just the industry, the uh, the the transformation industry, perhaps we should call it. Uh, there's dangers to it, you know, especially with, with kids, with young kids. Yeah, especially it's, when you start screwing with their hormones. Yeah, that's that's where I think we need to draw the line. But well, they it's don't okay. draw the line. There. They can do whatever they want. I'm just saying, arrest them. There'll be some word, you'll attach the word justice to one of these situations. And you gender to, justice. Well, let's, let's work on gender a few. justice. Gender, That's a good one. Gender justice. We can go with gender justice. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. The, the word, you're right. The I'm word, writing it down too. Gender justice. So we have uh, podcast justice. It's, it's, I like the alliteration of gender justice, though. That's kind of cool. Podcast justice, which is 
a, a, a artificial construct, but I think gender justice has legs. We we could run with it. <laughs> well, if it has legs, you could usually run with it. <laughs> or maybe not. Oh, uh, I'll do some more Austin news since, you know, we're so decadent here. We don't give a crap. Seems like there's a new company every day. Well, maybe not every day, but the competition is definitely heating up. Austin's a great choice to uh, expand our services and I'm really excited to be here. Skip is the latest company to bring two wheels to these city streets. Uh, it will bring 500 more by Friday. Uh, we worked hard with, with Austin and the city council to ensure that we'll be operating um, as a partnership rather than just as a, uh, a group coming in and, and dropping scooters off. That'll total eight companies with wheels on the ground, with two more on the way. They want to continue operating here and have been really responsive. Yep, you heard that right. In addition to Skip, transportation companies Razor and Wind Mobility have also been approved to launch in Austin. When they do come, that'll add 700 more scooters to the market. But Woo! Council Member Kathy Tovo promises that's it for now. We've got as, as many as we need for this market. The fact of the matter is, people have really enjoyed the, the ride matter. so far. Yep. City data shows Austinites have taken over 4 million scooter trips since the initiative launched last year. While Tovo says she hears your concerns, she still thinks there's room to grow. Over time, that will probably balance out as we really get a sense of what our market can bear. Austin City Council. This is a council. This is a council member talking like that a tech executive. Me, 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 me. Yeah, that woman. Yeah, she's is talking. Council member. Yeah, she's talking like a tech executive. We'll see what the market can bear. Here's your concerns. Thank she you. still thinks there's room to grow. Over time, that will probably balance out as we really get a sense of what our market can bear. Austin City Council is currently working with the companies to find a way to limit the speed and usage of the scooters in certain sections of the city. It's a term called geofencing. It's already being used at the UT campus, and at this point, the technology isn't yet developed to be implemented elsewhere around town. Mm. <laughs> so, I, actually, I'm, I'm sad I even played that because I have something much more important to discuss. Uh, there were two bills that passed for uh, border... Mm, what do we call it? Border... Uh, service, help, emergency, etc. One in the House and one in Senate. Uh, the one in the House was voted down by the Senate. Uh, now the Senate took that, had some amendments and some changes, and uh, it the looks US like... The U.S. Senate or the Texas Senate? U.S. Senate, I'm sorry. U.S. Oh, okay. House of Representatives. This all happened under, you know, yesterday. This would, this okay. went down yesterday. You didn't hear much about it. No, uh, I didn't. But, but, I, but I wanted to bring it up because it shows the... Um, uh, the disgusting nature of what of the narrative that is being played and what is actually happening at the border and what this is all really about. It's about a four and a half billion dollar um, uh, le legislative bill that what allocates money uh, to what is happening on the border. Nothing with border security. Nothing uh, with a wall or anything like that. Um, not even you know more enforcement. This is all. Well, you've, you've been hearing it in the news. Here's the AOC. There is a very clear academic consensus on what constitutes a concentration camp, and that is the mass detention of a community of people without a trial or due process. I think it's pretty universally uh, and non-controversial to say that the administration is doing exactly that and meets the academic requirement for what a concentration camp is. You're not comparing this to what happened in World War II? No, no. I, while concentration camps were employed, uh, during that time, concentration camps were also utilized in a wide, uh, in all over the world, including in the United States with a Japanese internment. So, you know, that's how horrible everything is that this is like concentration camps. OK, Adam Schiff. Let me ask you, President Trump uh, tweeted yesterday that he's going to delay plans uh, for these ice mass deportations in major cities across the United States to allow two weeks for Congress to, quote, get together and work out a solution to the asylum and loophole problems at the southern border. Are you open to negotiations on this to, to avoid uh, those deportations two weeks from now? Uh, we've always been uh, open to negotiations. And in fact, we have been negotiating, and there is a bipartisan package in the Senate uh, of some emergency supplemental relief to try to provide assistance. But make no mistake, there is nothing that Congress is doing or not doing that compels the administration to have facilities where children don't have blankets or toothbrushes or soap. 
and for the vice president or the president to blame Congress for their own malfeasance uh, is just uh, completely uh, besides the point and unethical and unacceptable. Uh, they could cure this problem today, uh, but they don't want to because, frankly, the cruelty is part of their policy. It's part of what they think will deter uh, migrants from coming here. It's part of what they think will motivate the Congress to build a wall. Uh, and to use these children that way is, I, I just think, immoral. No, uh, it, it, this, yeah. is, it, this, is, this is him projecting because he is, in fact, using children this way in immoral fashion because this is not about the children. This is what the immigration issue is really about. Money, big ass money, two billion eight hundred and eighty. One million five hundred and fifty two thousand dollars is going to the partners of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Uh, these are mainly religious organizations, Catholic or a lot of Republican or uh, oriented organizations who are getting this money for refugee and entrant assistance. Yeah, we've discussed this. You've discussed this. I know, a but of I, I got to keep bringing show. it up because now we have the picture of the father and the daughter drowned face down in the water crossing the Rio Grande. What, now, whatever they were crossing, it's it's yeah. disgusting well, you because you're just doing this for your big donors, all sides. I'm not going to argue this, but I want to play this. This is the democracy. Now, I don't know if it was on the show, but this is a teaser. This is another little angle of the same story. But this one was the eye roller of the month. I'm a former child in incarcerated during World War II. This is a photograph of me when I was in prison. 75 years ago, 120,000 of us were removed from our homes and forcefully incarcerated in prison camps across the country. We're here today to protest the repetition of history. <laughs> what was that the all repetition about? Repetition of history? Yes, concentration camps, baby. No, it's she said there was 120,000 of us removed from our homes oh. and put in detention camp, and we don't want to have a repetition. Uh, re- oh. A, 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 <laughs> repetition of history and i'm thinking where is this happening so who's being removed from their homes i don't think well the the trump promised he was going to remove people from their homes well he hasn't done much about that well you know why and he hasn't removed them to take them put them in a concentration camp he wants to remove them to deport them yeah but you know why is because uh all uh, just like uh the Ira- so-called iran bombing the targets were all announced. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't supposed to be out on in the news that he was going to do this. But you know, someone leaked it, of course. And so this is not the time to do a, a raid on anything if they're expecting you to show up. Yeah, well, that's for sure. Remember, this is a four, actually, four point six billion dollar bill. Oh, for toothbrushes and water and beds. Okay, twenty seven million shall be available for the purposes of adding beds. Of which no less than, uh, let's see, what do we have? We have 8 million available for case management. I mean, th- the money is going to the Office of Re- Refugee Resettlement. The bulk of the money is going to the prison complex who run these, who run these things, which, is, of course, is, can only be Republicans. No, Obama was all over in Houston. Woohoo! He set them up real purdy. So let's not make any, let's not, let's just be honest about it. This is huge money. A billion dollars is a lot. Four billion dollars is a lot, a lot. People just, you know, you get used to these numbers. Oh, a billion here, a billion, a thousand million. In the wind. So they can port well, them off to Maine. Well, cost a lot of money. And they need to port, you know, they, they send them off to Maine. Eh, Maine, needs, uh, Maine needs immigrants. Oh, we'll send them over there. The trafficking is legalized. The trafficking is being done by the U.S. government. The trafficking yeah. is the yeah, Office of Refugee Resettlement. Stop it. Yeah. Stop it. Stop what? Stop the immigration. <laughs> yeah. No, they're not going to do it because neither party has any benefit. And honestly... Um, white and black people in America don't want to work on the farm. They don't want to pick fruit. There's another issue with that. So everyone can be all high and mighty, but... Well, that's another form of decadence. Thank you very much. Exactly. Decadence. (sighs) 
Oh, I hope you. I'm glad you got that off your chest. Yeah, well, it's it, it. We've done it many times before, and you know, AOC was out there like, meh, meh, meh. that's exactly what she sounds like. I'd have to say she'd voted against the bill, so I'll, I'll give her props for that. But she, not because she really understands, and she thinks it's just you know, concentration camps. <laughs> concentration camps and then finally Don't repeat no repetition of history <laughs> uh finally for me uh you probably saw bitcoin which you know i've become a maximalist uh, a year ago uh it shot up to what was it like uh, almost what it, almost 1400 went to 13,800 it's dropped down a bit now um not quite sure exactly what the catalyst is, although I have a feeling that whatever China decides to say after the weekend with the G20 will um, will give us some clues. But it's also gaining real legitimacy uh, as a hedge strategy. This is Christina Hooper from Invesco on CNBC. What do you make of the safe haven trade, which has been gaining momentum over the last week? If you look at the Japanese yen, the 10-year yield breaking below 2% again, uh, and even gold at a six-year high. Well, certainly there are a lot of safe haven trades, and I've heard some strategists argue, in fact, that Bitcoin is a safe haven trade or perhaps an indicator that we're agree? getting close. Uh, I, I think that Bitcoin might be a sign of, of fears about recession, um, but but certainly it makes sense in this environment that we see investors looking for safe havens. But I do think it's a mistake with the Fed signaling its willingness to be a lot more dovish. So it's being taken seriously as a, as a as a as an asset, something that you can uh, safe uh, safe haven trade. Yeah, like Beanie Babies. <laughs> no, no. See, uh, like the the tulip trade would be more appropriate. People said, ah, Bitcoin, it's like the tulip mania. The tulips never came back. And Beanie Babies left and didn't really come back. They kind of came back. No, not, not the, like the, this. The Bitcoin has not left in the first place. It, it goes up and down. Well, let's quote John C. When Dvorak. When it gets back Bitcoin. down to 25 cents, then I... Yeah, <laughs> yeah what's, we'll your, what's the bottom, John? Call the bottom for us. Just 25 so we, cents. 25 cents, okay. <laughs> Beautiful. Which, by, by the way, is also the bottom for Twitter. So uh, they can have fun. They can, they can meet and greet when it gets down there. I do have one kind of a... Uh, you, uh, <clears throat> A clip I've been trying to get rid of, but it's always cracked me up because I, you had to actually visually, you got to see it. They had the first services in Notre Dame like a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Yeah. And everybody was in there with hard hats on it. And I, for some reason, to see a bunch of priests and altar boys and everybody with hard hats on, <laughs> I just cracked me up. Notre Dame held its first mass since a fire ravaged the Paris Cathedral in April. For security reasons, only 30 people were able to attend, all of them employees of the church. Members of the congregation wore hard hats, including the Archbishop of Paris, who led the service. <laughs> well, I'm glad you got that clip off your chest. Yeah, I did, finally. Uh, keep your eye on the G20. According to the uh, to the New York former New York banker, China will accept... Our terms, and uh, we will see an end to the tariff battle, and that would be good. Uh, so in other words, nothing's going to happen. He says it's going to happen. He says Xi Jinping will say, "I can work with this guy. We can work with these terms." Well, we'll see. Okay, we'll see. Hopefully, that's the case. That would that would market to go crazy. You no, know, it's a small prediction from the New York banker, and. Stay tuned for end of show uh, mixes. We've got uh, Jesse Coy Nelson and uh, a classic Chris Wilson and a drone again as requested. And coming to you from the fringe of Austin, uh, from the frontier of Austin, Texas, right the near the, where the pooping's taking place. In the morning, everybody, I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley. There's no pooping necessarily where I am, but it can happen any minute. I'm John C. Dvorak. Uh, stay tuned for a hog story on noagendastream.com if you're listening. We return on Sunday. Until then, adios, mofos, and such. Flying over Afghanistan Or maybe it was Pakistan 
I promised myself to aim myself at every woman, child, and man. That was on my list. I don't care if I missed. I'm remote controlled. I do what I'm told by someone at a computer. Obama gave me a push. More than Bush, and I cost millions. I'm supposed to target terrorists, but not so much civilians. I don't know what to say. Whoops, some got in my way. A drone again, naturally. A drone again, naturally. Police officers today can actually text a judge, tell them they've got you there, and you got a phone they want to look at, and the judge in the middle of the night can send you a text back and say he approves it, and bingo, boom, shakalaka. Bingo, boom, shakalaka. Bingo, boom, shakalaka. I like that. We can just drop that at the end of anybody's clip. Bingo, boom, shakalaka. You should make that as a little bitty clip. Bingo, boom, shakalaka. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Fantastic! Bingo, boom, shagalaga, boom, shagalaga, bingo, boom, shagalaga. I think we need to incorporate that into our vocabulary. Go ahead, make my bingo, bingo boom, shagalaga. I'm way ahead yeah. of you, buddy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> How fantastic! Bingo, boom, shagalaga, boom, shagalaga. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bingo, bingo boom, shagalaga. Great. We can just drop it at the end of anybody's clip. Yeah, whatever it is. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn bingo boom shagalaga. I'm sorry, Dan. Bingo boom shagalaga. I like that. What we've got here is failure to bingo boom shagalaga. You can't handle the bingo boom shagalaga. I see that. Bingo boom shagalaga. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about bingo, bingo boom shagalaga. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me bingo, bingo boom shagalaga. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. Instead of a bingo, bingo boom shagalaga. We well, just dropped it at the end of anybody's clip. Bingo boom shagalaga. Boom shagalaga. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Bingo, boom, shagalaga. Vasectomy, lobotomy. Give away all your masculinity. No balls and no brain. All that's left is slavery. Spreading fake news. A vasectomy does not involve cutting your nuts off because you know then I'm gonna have to listen to Brian Brushwood complain to me for another five years. <laughs> Doesn't know you know what it is. Please tell all the newcomers your theory. I discovered a book in the 1920s that I still have a copy of, and it's a talk about certain medical procedures. And vasectomies are not new, and they were used in the 20s uh, as a youth. Uh, fix. It would make you, the vasectomy was, t- men were told, get a vasectomy and you'll look younger. It's like, it's like the, another one that came along some years later was a, uh, the lobotomy. Yeah. There was actually a faddish thing and there was apparently some guy in, in Central Park that would give you, you can get lobotomies without having to really go into the doctor's office. They would slip a needle behind your eyeball and the thing was, I guess it was curved a certain way they could actually nick and cut off the little piece of the brain that hooks the front to the back. And since this was done to, I don't know, middle-aged guys, I'm not sure what the ages were, but I started noticing this with men who had had vasectomies, and I will say this, not all of them, but most of them start to look a little bit like an old lesbian. And... So as as, as if there's a uniform lesbian look. There is, I think. Well, and at least I think of, that there's a uniform lesbian I mean, I, look. I, think, I, I just think it's the Chris Hayes look. That's pretty much it.
info. Dvorak.org slash N-A Space 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 Space